the holograms for the driver's licenses. So each driver's license, if you pull your driver's license out, it's got like a it's got like a film over it that's got like so the state of Florida's got like the actual physical state of Florida that fluoresces uh, in the light. Uh, I was having those made, so I was getting sheets of uh, of the ones for the driver's license. I had them for every state: Pennsylvania, Florida, California, Colorado, fucking Michigan. I was had Chicago. I had South Dakota. I had fucking I had all the states. My name is John Boziak, and I'm a former credit card counterfeiter. From 2004 to approximately 2009, I manufactured and distributed roughly $3.5 million uh, in fraudulent credit cards. Uh, I did this by way of carding forums uh, over the internet. Um, you know, this all took place in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, this was before. This was before the Onion Router. Uh, you know, this was before uh, Tor Network, uh, which you know all the kids now call the dark web. Uh, you know, these things didn't exist uh, way back when. Um, as a matter of fact, this was uh, before YouTube. This was uh, in the very, very early days of, of Facebook. You know, this was. Um, you know, I think that when I got into carding, uh, MySpace was actually uh, still like a thing. You know, I was I was writing, I was coding MySpace pages for for money and shit. I, um, you know, I've always been into technology. I've always been into computers. Uh, I've always been fascinated by uh, digital imagery uh, and the you know manipulation of um, software systems, computer networks, and uh, you know other things like that. So that's kind of what got me into uh, you know fraud. That's what kind of got me into. Um, just being interested in that field of knowledge, um, you know. So consequently, when I decided to break the law, you know, carding was uh, for me just kind of um, a natural fit. But I guess I'll get into that um, a little bit later. Uh, I want to start with kind of where I grew up, um, you know, where I came from and where I grew up to maybe kind of give everybody a, a, a better idea of of who I am as a person and kind of like what led to the you know decisions that I uh, eventually made that landed me uh, in federal prison. Um, I was born um, February 6, 1985 in a small town in Michigan. Well, not really a small town, but a medium-sized city uh, in a suburb of Detroit uh, in Michigan uh, called Mount Clemens. Um, it's Really, there's nothing there. It was a manufacturing hub, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Now it's just a a burnt out town of white trash derelicts and uh, scumbags, uh, if you will. I apologize uh, if you live in Mount Clemens, but you know it's true. I, um, you know, I, I was born there. Uh, my whole family is from there. Well, not really Mount Clemens, but kind of like you know the general uh, metro Detroit area. You know, my family immigrated here. Uh, somewhere like around World War II, I, I believe my family immigrated here from Poland, uh, from Europe, and then you know my my parents, um, you know, were born here. Uh, like I said, I was born in Mount Clemens, Michigan, and you know I lived in Michigan up until maybe like 1992 or yeah, about 1992, and then uh, my mother moved me and my little brother from. Um, Mount Clemens, Michigan to um, Homestead, Florida. And, you know, if you guys know anything about Homestead, Florida in the year 1992, uh, you know, this is when Hurricane Andrew hit. And I remember, um, you know, my memory of Hurricane Andrew is, is, is foggy um, at best. You know, I think I was only maybe seven years old. I just remember it being very chaotic. Uh, I remember the, just the water and the wind, uh, you know, and like I said, the chaos, um, you know, I, I believe it completely leveled uh, everything around us. Uh, our house lifted off the foundation and kind of drifted all the way back to the edge of our property because, you know, just the surge of, of water and wind that hit us was, uh, it was pretty insane. And I heard quoted somewhere that uh, Hurricane Andrew was the worst natural disaster to hit the United States um, before Hurricane Katrina. Now, I don't even know if that's true, but uh, on a level of devastation, it was it was pretty intense. And I remember going through that, um, you know, as, as a little kid. And I remember after Hurricane Andrew um, could pretty much leveled our entire neighborhood, we moved to uh, Kendall, 
uh, we moved to Kendall, Florida, which is just a little bit north of, of Homestead. And I lived in Kendall for pretty much my entire adolescence, um, you know, all the way from uh, maybe 10 or, you know, three or four years old all the way up or no I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry seven all the way from seven years old you know up until my teenage years until I was you know off off and running doing my own thing um I, I had I guess what you could call a very eventful youth I um I spent a lot of time uh, in and out of uh boys homes group homes um, you know, uh, juvenile detention centers, boot camps, uh, you name it. Uh, if there was a program for wayward youth, uh, I spent some time there when I was a child. Uh, I believe I was probably incarcerated maybe, uh, if I had to if I really fucking pin it down, I was probably incarcerated six, seven, eight months out of every single year. You know, I was in a program and then, you know, I, I would just take off from the program sometimes if there weren't locked doors. I would just be like, I'd take off, I'd be out. Um, yeah, they'd catch me a couple months later and they put me in another program, but that's just the way it was, you know, growing up. And it got to the point to where my mother, um, she really couldn't control me. You know, I don't know. I have no, I have no idea what that's all about. You know what I mean? Um, she just couldn't, she couldn't get it figured out. Uh, so she, she left Florida, um, and moved back to Michigan, somewhere around I think I was maybe 13 or 14 years old and her and my little brother just moved back to Michigan and stayed in Michigan I was actually I was incarcerated in a boys home um, so when I got out of the boys home I essentially had the option to go back to Michigan or stay in Florida and I just chose to stay in Florida I um I never really liked Michigan too much I never really liked the people there I I don't care for cold weather <clears throat> you know Michigan it's always just a bummer. It's always been a place that's just fucking completely bummed me out. And I've lived there off and on throughout my whole entire life. Like, you know, I would, I'd go and I'd live there for, you know, four, five, six months here, a year here, two years here, three years here. So, like, I have a lot of roots in Michigan. I know a lot of people. I went to school, um, you know, up there off and on. <clears throat> but it's like, I don't know, man. So just something about that place, just it's like a dark cloud just hangs over you, you know, just hangs on me. And, you know, and maybe I attribute that to um, just a lot of my negative experiences with, with the place. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, um, you know, they really enjoy Michigan and they have a lot of positive memories and um, they, you know, they associate that with, with Michigan. But I just don't. I don't like the place at all. Um, <clears throat> consequently, that's where my entire family resides. I mean, my mom, my dad, my cousins, all my grandparents, everybody, you know. So if I ever want to see any of my family, I always have to travel to Michigan and, um, <laughs> yeah, travel to Michigan. And I just, I don't like to. So I, I don't see my, I don't see my family very often. I'm not, um, I'm not really, you know, one of those family oriented people. I don't, uh, you know, I don't really focus on that because too much because I just, it never really, I've never really had that. Um, you know, my family exists here on this planet, you know, they're, they're here. Um, and I'm, you know, sure they care about me. I mean, I know my grandparents love me. Uh, you know, I, my aunt and uncles, I know everybody cares about me, but they're there. I'm here and I'm living my life and they're living theirs, you know? So when I, you know, get incarcerated or I'm going through hardships in my life or, you know, it's like, I just, I don't have anybody to, tur to immediately, I've never really had anybody to, you know, immediately kind of turn to, um, you know, to, to be there for me. So it's kind of always just been me. I've always just relied on myself, you know, and I've always been, you know, on this person's couch or, you know, staying at this person's house, you know, cause like, when you're a teenager and you don't really, you can't really get a job. I mean, you can get a job, but you can't really, you can't rent an apartment. You know, nobody's going to give you a loan so that you can go and get a car. Like you don't, you don't have any of those options available to you until you're 18. And even when you're 18, you still need like a cosigner and down payments and, you know, all that shit. And, you know, growing up on the streets of Miami with, I had zero resources in way of, you know, family members and, and, people who were, you know, any kind of support network or, or even like a fucking safety net. Like I didn't even have a safety net, uh, as, as far as anything else was concerned, you know, it was always just me. It was always just me doing me and taking care of myself. So, you know, growing up on the street, it was like, I had to make decisions that, 
normal people, you know, never have to think about. Um, you know, I had to worry about like feeding myself and, you know, where, um, I was going to sleep that night, you know, so I dealing with a lot of those things, you know, living hand to mouth, um, and always kind of being in, uh, survival mode, you know what I mean? Like always living, living, living years in survival mode. Um, you know, I remember, you know, there's been times where I ate McDonald's, uh, 99 cent back when the double cheeseburgers used to be 99 cents. Now they're like a dollar five, dollar 10. Um, I survived on McDonald's cheeseburgers for, I don't know how long, like I would go to like all the fast food restaurants, uh, I would have to go there and the only, only thing on the menu I would be able to afford is the cheapest items uh, that were on the menu at, say, like Taco Bell or McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's. You know what I mean? Like I would get like the $5 bag or whatever it is. It comes with fucking like five nuggets, a cheeseburger, a little thing of fries. And I would have to eat that maybe once or twice a day and that would be it for me. Like I wouldn't, you know, because my resources... Uh, at this point, you know, being a young teen, um, I was lucky I was even, you know, able to hustle that really, you know, and that was fucking stealing or, um, I would run, you know, little scams where I would fucking, you know, go down to the public library and I would, uh, so I, I had this fucking scam where I would go to the public library and I, I somehow, I don't remember how I figured it out, but maybe I got it from somebody else, but they had the admin uh, password for the computers. So I was able to sit down and log in uh, with an admin password to the public library computer. So then I was able to like add programs, um, you know, to the computer. Whereas before you wouldn't be able, you can like down, you couldn't like, you know, install software or anything like that because you were just like, you know, going there to use it for browsing the internet or whatever. So your access was limited. Uh, but since I had administrative access to the um, the Fort Lauderdale public library system, I could, you know, go in and add programs and, you know, move files around and, you know, do whatever I wanted to do. So essentially, I would use the uh, Fort Lauderdale public library as my own, like, center for committing fraud or, like, altering documents. Like, I, I would, like, make fake insurance papers for people for, like, $30, $40 so that they could go to the DMV and fucking get their car registered and all that shit. Or, like, somebody, like, people would need, like, you know, um, hospital fucking, you know, records to saying that they had an operation or a disability or, like, so I would make all of those kinds of documents. And, like, this is, like, we're talking 2000... We're talking, fuck, this was fucking 98, 1998, 1999, 2000. You know, the, the, the computers were still running like Windows 98 and shit. So, you know, and I would fucking, LimeWire was like a thing and like BearShare was like a thing. You know what I mean? Like these fucking, um, these person-to-person -person file sharing fucking programs. Like Napster was like just like kind of phasing out and... So I used to go to the public library and I used to make documents. I used to for forge documents for people. That's one way I used to hustle. Another way I used to hustle was uh, I used to go down to the public library and I used to make fake uh, coupons to take to like Little Caesars or like McDonald's to get like free food and shit. Um, so I, I figured out how like UPC uh, labels work for, you know, uh, fast food you know, restaurants and, you know, all that shit. So once I figured that out, I was able to then take, um, you know, templates that I had made in Photoshop and kind of then make like, you know, legitimate looking coupons and I would take them and I would get free food that way too. So that's like another way I would hustle. Um, you know, and that's, you know, originally that's just where it started, um, you know, pretty much for me. And then it just kind of progressed from there, you know, and this is, this is this, so I'm in my early teens now. Um, and like I said, I had a, fucking pretty crazy youth um my youth was you know nuts i remember sleeping on top of buildings um you know hanging out with the hobos in fucking south beach miami getting fucking drunk uh you know i used to have fucking me now i'm completely sober uh, well i'm california sober i smoke pot uh every day but that's because i have i have fucking crohn's disease um from what I believe was just all the years of living on the street and eating fucking McDonald's hamburgers and shit. I really think that that fucked me up um, intestinally. So now I have all these fucking, you know, digestional problems and fucking, you know, all these intestinal problems because of because of this fucked up way I was living. Uh, so I smoke pot every day, but I, I don't drink liquor. 
Um, I don't take pills. I don't do cocaine, heroin. I never did. Like I was never, and that's another thing. Like I, you know, I, like I was around drugs my whole entire life. Like growing up on the streets, um, you know, you can imagine some of the characters that you, that you have to deal with. Um, and so I was exposed to, you know, meth. I was exposed to heroin. I was exposed to crack. I mean, all of the, the, the horrible things, um, and I just never, I never fucked around. Like, I just never got into crack. I never got into heroin. Um, I never got into meth or speed or nothing like that, you know. So, for me, it was always just, like, drinking and smoking. Like, I used to drink a lot. And I used to smoke a lot of weed. Well, I still smoke a lot of weed. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I used to, I still smoke a lot of weed. But for me, it was, like, getting drunk and just, like, hanging out at the beach and getting stoned. Um, you know, and listening to like all of the homeless people tell their stories about their, how they fucked up their lives and how they had millions of dollars. And they had, I used to listen to this one guy, uh, I used to hang out with this one guy in Fort Lauderdale beach. He was, he was, his name was the professor. That's what I, I named him the professor and then everybody else started calling him the professor. But I called him the professor because he, he would always talk about, uh, his days at Yale. Cause I guess he went to Yale university and he was always talking about like the dissertation he would, he gave on, uh, like, like the entanglement theory of quantum physics, uh, during his, when he was getting his PhD. But, you know, from looking at this guy, he looked like, he looked like Tom Hanks, uh, at the end of the fucking movie when he was on the Island by himself for fucking like six years or whatever the fuck it was. Um, I don't remember the name of the fucking movie, but the dude looked rough. You know, he looked like a goddamn caveman. He had half his teeth on the top were missing. His hair was long. He had a fucking raggedy ass beard, two different shoes on. One of them had laces in it. The other one didn't. And when he walked the fucking tongue on the shoe would just fucking flop. Uh, he was, you know, matted with dirt, smelled like piss and fucking beer. But believe it or not, I had some of the most intelligent conversations I've ever had with anybody have been with this um, mangy, you know, fucking human that, that, that I could barely sit next to because he fucking stunk so bad. Um, I mean, mental health is a motherfucker, ain't it? So, but no, yeah, I called him the professor and yeah, I used to have conversations about, you know, fucking, uh, you know, like I said, quantum entanglement theory and like the universe and the way, uh, you know, the, the, how we're going to travel to you know, distant galaxies in the future because we're going to have like a, a better, you know, fundamental understanding of the way the physics work. And it, just these conversations with this guy were fucking, you know, but obviously he was insane. And, um, you know, that's just one memory I have of, of living on the street uh, you know, and then there's the dark side, you know, you got fucking gay dudes that come down to the strip, uh, and they try and pick up the young, the young boys that are down there homeless. And there's like that whole predator prey, uh, kind of thing going on that like all the homeless kids talk about it. Like, you know, Oh yeah, watch out for him. Cause he comes down here and he's going to try and buy you cigarettes and talk to you like he's your friend, but really he wants you just to fucking suck his dick or whatever. So like, there's those kind of fucking, you know, predators that come down there and prey on the young boys um fortunately i was never fucking you know victim i never fell victim to any of that shit because uh i guess i was just never desperate enough i don't know fucking it never really i was never really in that position to where i needed to fucking you know do anything like that um i was always resourceful enough to at least have somewhere to sleep whether it was outside but like you know, and hidden on a roof in like a fucking janitor's closet or fucking some kind of like clever little spot where I was comfortable. And I always could figure out a way to feed myself, whether that was like, I knew, um, where each a food bank was set up, uh, you know, all around the fucking city, like Fort Lauderdale, Miami. Like I knew what fucking soup kitchen fed on like Wednesdays, you'd go over here and get spaghetti, you'd go over here and get pancakes on fucking Friday. But you know, you always had to sit through some fucking bullshit, fucking church service and, you know, pray to Jesus and amen and all that goddamn shit. But then you got to eat a good ass meal. So, uh, I just went and fucking sang with Jesus with everybody else. And I fucking, and then I got to eat my free food at the end, you know, so I, I fucking learned how to do that hustle i learned how to get free bus uh free bus passes um you know uh for like the week and for like the month so i could ride all the public transportation uh in fort lauderdale like in broward county uh, i figured that shit out you know i used to fucking hang out at the um <laughs> i used to hang out so if for anybody that doesn't know like so like the homeless scene back 20 years ago when i was homeless cause i haven't been homeless in like 20 years this is you know back in probably I'd say I was homeless from about 2000 and 
Well, there's different stages of homelessness. So I was homeless. So there's sleeping on friends' couches and, you know, going to sleep at this girl's house. Like, always having somewhere to, like, sleep and shower. There's that kind of homeless. We all know those guys, those fucking bums. But then there's the other kind of homeless where you're just on the fucking street. You know, uh, sleeping behind trash cans. You don't know when you're going to shower. You're in and out of homeless shelters, all that crazy shit. So there's different levels of homelessness. But I would say... Um, my levels, my level of homelessness, when I finally reached that that point where I was on the street sleeping outside every day, that probably started in two thousand and four, two thousand and fuck, probably two thousand and two, till about two thousand and I would say two thousand and five. So for like a solid three years, um, I didn't have a residence. Uh, I didn't have anywhere really I was fucking sleeping. Like, I would have cars periodically or they would break down or, like, I'd, sometimes they would get towed and, like, I wouldn't even have the money to get them out. So I would lose my car and then, like, everything I owned would be in the vehicle. I couldn't get any of it back. That was always a fucking bummer. Um, so I had, I had vehicles periodically and I would sleep in my car periodically here, periodically there. But it was like, you know, I, I was just in this mentality. And plus, I was, you know, I'm a teenager. Like, I'm growing up. And at a time where I'm, you know, I need stability and I need routine in my life and I need that feeling of, you know, um, I, where I know where I'm going to sleep at tonight and I know where my food's going to come from. I just didn't have that at all. I was on the street. You know, I was stealing. I was running scams. I was robbing. I was fucking, you know, everybody wants to fuck you or fucking rob you or fucking take advantage of you or, you know what I mean, or have you on some kind of dummy mission that's going to make them money and put send you to jail. Like, there's so much shit that goes on when you're just out there on the street as a teenager and you have no guidance and, you know, like, nobody telling you what to do. It's fucking, it's, it's a pretty crazy world. Um, you know, so that's just how I grew up. Uh, you know, and I never had that stability um, where other people did. And I never really, um, you know, I don't really feel like I was given a fair chance at, you know, being any kind of productive in life or, or even learning the skills to be anywhere productive in life. Like I didn't, I never really thought that I had that, that chance. And I think it's just through pure luck and maybe just good genetics. Like I, I attribute a lot of, of, of my mindset and a lot of uh, my presence in the universe and in this world to um, my, just my genes. Like it has to be, you know, um, because it's, it's nothing that I've done on my own. It's no effort that I put in to make myself as intelligent as I am or as people, as other people tell me uh, I am, because I, I honestly don't really feel like I'm intelligent. I am, uh, if anything, I just have a really good memory. Uh, and I, I think that's what I attribute um, my a kind of appearance of being really intelligent is, is I'm, I'm just able to retain things that I hear and kind of regurgitate that at convenient times to make myself appear more intelligent. Um, so really, I'm just a fucking grifter. Uh, you know, I'm full of shit. Um, but like I said, I have some really good memory and I can memorize things. Um, I think true intelligence are people who are able to um, solve complex problems with original ideas. Uh, you know, people who are able to think outside of the box, people, uh, you know, as, as polarizing a figure as he is, people, guys like Elon Musk, uh, you know, who are able to, if they can't figure the problem out themselves, are smart enough to know when to, uh, you know, corral or pool other resources or other people to, to solve, a, to collectively solve a problem. I think that's true intelligence, uh, you know, and I think that's uh, just something I don't have. You know, even even like my big crime of the century that I did that, you know, netted me millions of dollars was basically just me um, mimicking some of what other people have already done. You know, it was me figuring out a process that had already been done a thousand times before. I just figured out how to do it uh, and mimic it and then, you know, make it work for my own benefit, um, which I want to get into. So I digress. Um <laughs> I grew up on the street, like I said, you know, and that's just, that's my background. Um, that's basically my childhood, uh, you know, in a nutshell, um, you know, wasn't really big on relationships, didn't really have uh, a whole lot of connection, um, with other human beings, uh, in my life as far as like little long lasting friendships or even like family members that check in with me on a regular basis or anything like that. You know, it's kind of just been me, 
um, you know, jumping from one puddle to the next, uh, you know, and now I'm 37 years old and I'm just, now I'm here in front of a camera. Um, you know, pretty much that's the deal. But so the story on, so let me get into how I, how I made almost $4 million manufacturing fraudulent credit cards. Um, so growing up, as I had already told you guys, I've been, you know, fascinated by computers and, uh, you know, Adobe Photoshop and photo editing and all those things like that. And I was uh, kind of influenced by a, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Johnson. Um, now, Mr. Johnson was a counselor who, who, Mr. Johnson was a counselor who worked at the Covenant House in Fort Lauderdale. Now, if a lot of people probably haven't even heard of the Covenant House, but Covenant House is a uh, nonprofit program, uh, kind of like a, just an outreach um, center for wayward youth, uh, kids who don't have a family, have, they have nowhere to go, kids that are caught up in the system uh, and, you know, are in between, say, foster homes or, you know, coming out of the system and need to be transitioned into, you know, back into the community, um, you know, so that's what Covenant House is. Now, and from my understanding, I didn't know this at the time, but Covenant House actually has locations in, I think, every major city all around the country. I know they're in here in Florida because I was in the one in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I know they're in California. They're in Detroit because I ended up in one of the fucking Covenant Houses in Detroit, uh, believe it or not, which wasn't as nice as the one in Florida. Um, so they're in every city all over all over the country, and I, you know, just by way of the way I was living uh, as a youth, I ended up in Covenant House, Fort Lauderdale, um, and so they had all kinds of programs there at Covenant House where they, you know, they will um, find you a job and find you in an apartment and, uh, you know, just help you get your life back together, pretty much. And so there was this counselor there that, you know took a liking to me. I don't know why. Me and him were just really cool. He was he was kind of a younger guy. Um, I was young. I was a teenager at this time. I was getting ready to graduate high school. Um, and, you know, believe it or not, through all of this, uh, I was going to high school. I was making myself go to school every day because, A, that's where all the girls were. And so, you know, I had to be there because, I, you know, I, I love women, especially as a teenager. I was just fucking absolutely insane with girls. Um, B, that's where I would hustle at. Like that's basically where I would fucking, you know, sell a little bit of pot here and there, not, you know, massive quantities or anything like that. I'd go buy like an ounce and I'd roll the whole entire ounce up into joints. I'd spend like an hour, two hours just rolling joints and I'd take the joints and I'd sell them for five dollars each at school and I'd fucking sell, you know, all the people were buying joints, smoking them and shit. So I made make money that way. And there's just other ways to hustle because you know, like you networking and there's people, there's always fucking money moving around and shit going on. And despite my, you know, very eventful youth, I was actually a good student when I applied myself. Uh, you know, I always kept at least uh, a 3.59 GPA in high school. Um, you know, I never really struggled uh, academically. Like nothing was hard for me. I never felt like I was actually even challenged uh, when I did actually pay attention in class and do my, do my, do my assignments. I, um, I was always the, like, one of the first people done with my, with my test. I mean, I wasn't by far the smartest person in the fucking class. I'm not going to sit here and blow smoke like I'm, you know, some kind of fucking academic, academic genius, which I'm not. Um, what I'm saying is the curriculum <laughs> at the high school I went to just wasn't challenging enough. So, you know, I would always have extra time in school because I didn't really have to worry about my schoolwork because that was always done. And my grades were always, you know, decent enough to where, uh, even though I was a class clown and a smart ass, my teachers, you know, they would cut me a lot of slack because I was a good student. Um, so yeah, that's so that was my fucking, what the fuck am I even talking about? Mr. Johnson, that's right. Let me get back to Mr. Johnson. Um, so Mr. Johnson was a counselor here at the Covenant House where I was staying at. And he was, um, he did a lot of graphic design. He was into like, uh, you know, doing CSS, you know, like, Back in the day when, you know, before all this was done through algorithms now, you know, you used to have to manually go in and, you know, you code the way you want your website to look at. And it was, it was really cool. And he kind of turned me on to a lot of this shit. And then there was a program uh, that they had at the Covenant House where they could put me in the uh, Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, um, in Fort Lauderdale. And so they, they, they could like, they would do the paperwork for you. They had people that worked with them that could get people that were, you know, um, you know, gifted or, you know, 
showed inclination towards, um, you know, what the degrees were offered at that institution. So I was, uh, you know, afforded that opportunity to go to the Art Institute in Fort Lauderdale. And I went there, um, I went there for two and a half years. I got my associate's degree in graphic design, media arts, which that whole process was like extremely fucking crazy because I ended up getting kicked out of Covenant House while I was going uh, to, to school. Like I graduated high school, and then when you're 18, like, you can only be at Covenant House until you're, like, 18. And after you're 18, they, like, they do, they transition you to uh, these apartments. So they have, like, a whole apartment complex they work with where they can put the Covenant House people into the apartment complex. And it's basically just, like, a... Um, uh, like an income based housing, like whatever your income was, it was based on that. So, and I think I was only making like 15 bucks an hour or something like that. So my rent was like 250, $225. I don't even think it was that a month. So I was in Wilton Manors. Um, and that's where the apartment complex was. Yeah. That's what I was getting to. I'm, I'm fucking rambling now. Um, so they had this apartment complex. They put you in, in, in Wilton Manors and you pay like a percentage of your rent or whatever, but I ended up fucking all of that up. Uh, I started partying and fucking taking Xanax and fucking drinking and like hanging out. Cause like, I don't know, like, like I said, I just like, I mess with girls. I mess with the wrong girls. I mess with wild girls. I like to party and shit. Not, not too much anymore. Um, but teenage years, you know, early twenties. Um, absolutely. And so, uh, I fucked up and I got kicked out of covenant house. I got kicked out of the, uh, apartments over there and I was basically homeless, but I was still going to class every day because it was basically the only thing I had to do. And since I was going to school, I would get like food stamps because I was a student. So, and I would get like all these other benefits, um, you know, from like the state of Florida and, uh, the county, uh, like Broward County, like, you know, like all my transportation, all my food, like I didn't have to worry about nothing. All I had to do was go to school. And the fact that I was actually interested in like what I was going to class for, um, that got me to the front door every day and got me uh, into the seat, um, in the classroom. So coincidentally, what ended up happening is I was actually living in my car. Um, I was living in my car while I was going to the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. And I remember the, the security guard that worked the um, parking structure overnight. I used to fucking get weed for him. So he used to let me in at night when it was closed. And he used to let me sleep in my car in the parking garage. And in the morning, I would just wake up and I would, you know, go down and I would just go to class. And I'd be in class all day, which I only had like three classes um, that day or whatever. I'd have like three classes every day or some shit like that, or like three, twice a week. I remember what it was. Um, but I would just hang out on campus all day or whatever, or, or hang out, you know, in that area downtown, like off of, uh, Los Olas. And, um, so I, that's what I did for two and a half years, pretty much not the whole two and a half years. Cause I, you know, I went, I lived living in the covenant house apartment, but I ended up, like I said, I ended up fucking all that up. And then, so I was basically homeless. Um, when I graduated from the uh, Art Institute uh, of Fort Lauderdale, I graduated in 2000 and I believe 2005 or 2006. Fuck, I don't remember. I smoked a lot of pot. Um, so forgive me if some of my timelines are off or, you know, I don't remember a lot of the details from my past are kind of fucking hazy because I just I smoke a lot of pot. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> I was fucking, I was, like I said, I was almost homeless when I graduated. Like, I think I was living, I think I was like living on, it was like four of us that I had met. We were all going to that school and I hustled just enough to be able to, I couldn't even pay rent at the place. Like they were letting me live on the couch, but I hustled enough to pay for groceries uh, for everybody. So I just paid for groceries and I would cook every once in a while and they let me sleep on the couch and take showers there. Um, towards like the end of, of when I was getting ready to graduate from the Art Institute. And so... When you're getting ready to graduate from the Art Institute, they have something called like, um, kind of like a, like an open house, like a, like a fucking, uh, I don't know what you say, like a career day or some shit like that. So like potential companies who own, um, businesses in like the field of like your graduation. So my, my, my degree was in, um, graphic design and media arts. So there were companies there that say were like uh, graphic design companies, print companies, um, you know, companies that would obviously, you know, use you, uh, when you graduate. 
And so when I graduate, when I was getting ready to graduate, I'm going to this like job fair pretty much is what it was. And uh, you take your portfolio with you and you just stop at all these different booths and you talk to the people and you're like, okay, here's basically what I've been working on over the past two years. This is what I've learned. This is what, uh, this is where I see myself going in the next five years. And I do, I must've talked to probably 50 or 30 or 40 fucking people that day, you know? So uh, I graduated in like a week. Before I was getting ready to graduate, uh, I got called down to the counselor's office and they had a letter um, and it was like an email and kind of letter kind of deal from a one of the companies who was uh, at the job fair and they had an offer for me. They wanted me to come work for them. Uh, they were going to offer me uh, a salary position and, um, you know, with a contract for, you know, X amount uh, for a year for this much salary for blah, blah, blah. It was really good. It was, it was ridiculous. It was like four times what any graphic design artist was making. And like the counselor was like, listen, I've never seen, I've seen very few offers like this. And I've been doing this. I've been here at the school doing it 10 years. And he's like, I've been other places doing it for 20 years. And he's like, offers like these don't really come along uh, with this kind of salary. He's like, you even if it isn't for you, uh, you would just for the experience. I, I would, I, you would be an idiot to walk away from this. So I took my counselor's, uh, I took my counselor's advice and I went ahead and I fucking, I agreed to the offer. I so like in like a week or like a month, I graduated and I went to go work for this company. Uh, it was a print company out of Miami. Um, you know, and so I, we, we did vehicle wraps, we did, um, flyers, we did t-shirts, we did screen printing, we did, um, we did digital media, we did all kinds of shit. And there was like three graphic design artists I started with. One of the guys who was on the team, um, there was no, there was a there was a chick, and she didn't go to school. She had no background, no education. She was just learning, and she was learning from the dude, like the the head graphic design artist. But this guy was going back to his country and somewhere in South America, and he wasn't going to be able to stay on with the company. So they got me out of straight out of school with my degree to go there, and he kind of like didn't teach me graphic design, obviously, because I already knew what I was doing, but he kind of taught me, uh, you know, just the business, the business side of things, how they operate, how to implement, you know, um, you know, the day-to-day -day operations, what their, uh, how their business operated, all those things. And so I kind of just took over for him. Like I worked there six months with him and then he went back to his country and then I was pretty much running the show. I fucking, I brought on another person that I went to school with. I fucking brought him on and hired him. Uh, gave him a fucking crazy, you know, got uh, brokered a crazy deal for him and got him some money. Um, and I got the chick a raise because she really wasn't getting paid shit. She was, she was a cool chick, um, you know, had a family and all that. Uh, so I got her a raise and, you know, we we're all making fucking pretty good money in there. I worked there for probably another nine or ten months, I would say. Uh, just long enough to, you know, get into uh, like a 42-month fucking uh, lease on a brand new Cadillac and get me a, you know, very nice apartment slash condo on Brickell Avenue in downtown Miami. Just enough to get myself into all of this debt uh, while still having all of this student loan debt. I mean, I'm not making good decisions at this point, not financially, because I, you know, I didn't grow up with money. I grew up, you know, uh, panhandling outside of the McDonald's on, on Lincoln Road in South Beach. Um, so, you know, I'm not, you know, at, at this point, not, I'm not very savvy when it comes to the dollar. Uh, you know, so I'm getting in, I get myself into all this debt because, you know, now I get to have all this nice shit because I got, I'm getting like 80 grand a year, whatever they were fucking paying me uh, at this place. And so I get myself into all this debt and I show up to work one day and the feds were there. Uh, I don't remember if it was FBI, fucking Secret Service, whoever the fuck it was. Uh, they were there. They had the whole place like, we weren't, we're not coming to work today. Uh, not today, pretty much. Uh, I got interviewed. They just asked me a bunch of questions about how long I'd been working there, uh, and then how much, you know, how many uh, the interaction, how much interaction I'd had with the owner, and you know, this person, that person, the other person. And I told them, and like, you know, I told them, like, listen, you know, they came. I, I showed, I, I graduated. They came and they got me from the fucking job fair or whatever like that. And then that was the end of it. Like, I never, I had that one interview, um, you know, with the with the cops or whatever, and that was it. And they're like, okay, well, this business is being closed and, you know, for, uh, foreclosed and seized and whatever. I was like, okay. Just as I was leaving, the uh, owner's wife pulled up and I just happened to be really cool with her. Um, I don't know if maybe she, you know, she liked me or whatever, but me and her were always just really fucking, she's always, you know, a straight shooter with me. And she showed up, she gave me a check and she gave my homie a check and she gave the chick that I work with, uh, all of us, a check. She cut three checks. She said, go to the bank and cash these right now. She said, not tomorrow. Not Friday. She said, as soon as you leave here, I'm going to sign these. 
drive to the bank and cash these. And it was basically a check for the remainder of my um, pay for the rest of the year, which was a nice chunk of money. Um, and I had another deal worked out with the owner that they were going to take care of my student loans for me and then let me just owe them money instead of owing like, you know, the financial institutions or whatever, which never happened. I mean, it was, I, it was going to, they were going to, I think they had made like a couple payments for me, but they never took care of my, my student loan debt. So now I, I lost my job, um, but I had a chunk of money and I had, you know, I'm always confident about my ability to, you know, create wealth for myself and, uh, you know, create opportunity for myself. Even to this very day, I'm, I'm you know, fully confident in my ability to uh, create opportunity and create wealth for myself and, you know, always be able to, to take care of myself, no matter how crazy um, I may look. And so, you know, at this point, I'm like, okay, well, I'll just get another job. I got now because now I have experience and now I have like 13 months or something like that. 14 months I worked at this place. I got an experience now and I got a college degree. Um, so I started applying, you know, job, monster job, job, uh, monster.com, job.com, all those fucking you know, places where you, I'd even pay to have my resume sent off. Um, and I got a lot of interviews, but this nobody wanted to pay me. First of all, nobody was paying salary and everybody wanted to pay me like 10, $15 an hour to come and pretty much run their fucking business for them. Um, and even at say $20 an hour, I wouldn't have been able to maintain my lifestyle. I, I wouldn't have been able to maintain not even the rent or my car payment at 20 bucks an hour because that's just how I was used to living. You know, and I wasn't running scams. I had been out of the scam world now since I graduated uh, from college. I really hadn't been running any scams for like, I'd say a year, two years. So I, you know, I didn't really, I wasn't plugged into the fucking, the seedy underground of, of South Florida the way I had been in previous years, you know? So I was just like, I was in a position to where I had to figure out how to pay for all this shit or I was going to either have to fucking lose all of it and go back to fucking being homeless on the street. And that just wasn't something that I was willing to accept. You know, I never, I never wanted to go backwards. And I always remember my whole life ever since a kid, I, I never went backwards. I was always, I've always been here. And then next week I'll be here next month. I'll be here, you know, maybe uh, micro steps, but I've, I've never been like had it everything. And then all of a sudden lost it all. Except for when I, when I went to prison, obviously, uh, you know, and then I got out and had to rebuild my life and start all over again. But that was, you know, not something that was like a regular occurrence in my life. I've always been able to climb and climb and, and progress. So what do I do is I hop on the internet because now it's 2005 like or something like that, 2000, yeah, about 2004, 2005, and now like fraud is just like the internet starting to take off like the dot-com era was like 2000 like you know five years previous youtube is like now just like starting to come out facebook's been out for a little while um now fraud is starting to come over here from europe and like credit card fraud is, has been in europe fucking since the 90s like they they do everything over there first they've been cloning cards and doing chip and pin uh you know they had chip and pin in europe before a decade before they fucking had it over here uh in america i remember before the cards had the fucking our, the chips in them you know before you could stick it in everybody was swiping um so you know this is early 2000s and the internet at that point um, as far as like illicit information, um, you didn't have to go to like the dark web to find it. You know, it, you didn't have to go to the dark web to find, uh, because there was no dark web and illicit information was allowed to just kind of flow and, and, and propagate, um, on the internet. Um, you know, without any problems, you know, like there wasn't, there wasn't big task force set up to fucking crack down on all this shit. Not like there is now. And towards the end of, of when I started doing things, there actually, there actually was, you know, a couple operations, um, you know, to take down uh, all of the forums and all that shit. But uh, I guess we can get into that later. Um, well, not too much because I don't really know that much about it, but nonetheless, the internet was a fucking hotbed for 
whatever you wanted to get into. Um, so I was able to source uh, just a lot of information uh, at this point in time about different frauds. So I was you know, looking at alternative means of, of finance to be able to take care of all my bills. You know, I had fucking student loans stacked up against me. I had fucking this condo at this point uh, was costing me like fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month, and this is way back when. This is now. Now that's reasonable for a fucking shithole in the ghetto. You know, but back then, if you have, if you're paying two grand a month, uh, you got a nice place. You know, so that, and I had a brand new Cadillac. I had a fucking STS uh, that I was like six hundred and fifty dollars a fucking month or something like that. I was getting raped. Uh, you know, not to mention, um, I didn't grocery shop, so I was eating out three times a day. You know, there was no DoorDash back then. You know, none of these services even fucking existed. You know, I was, so I was eating out at restaurants every day. I was going out to fucking, I wasn't eating McDonald's. I fucking, I, I assure you that, uh, that's for sure. You know, so I was eating good. I was, um, you know, I didn't really party too much. And that's, see, that's the whole thing about this whole, whole ride is I didn't even really start partying until later, later on. Like I've always been kind of just like a no, you know, nonsensical, uh, kind of person. Now, don't get me wrong. I've partied, like hung out somewhere and got fucked up and, you know, drunk a whole bunch and, and smoked some joints and shit like that. And, you know, talked, you know, politic and all night. But I've never been really the kind to go out in the town and really just fucking tear it up. Uh, I eventually did, but for for majority of my life, I just, I didn't live like that, you know. So, like I said, here we go, I'm again rambling. I'm on the internet and I'm just, I'm on these, I'm browsing these forums and I'm reading tutorials about fraud and about scams and about like money laundering and bank fraud and like uh, check kidding, like, you know, uh, cashing a check over here and then depositing over here and then, you know, faking, you know, so like there were all these tutorials, um, you know, being written because in the early 2000s, there were probably maybe five or six different uh, carding forums or like fraud forums that, 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 I, that I was aware of that I was on. Uh, and that was probably Shadow Crew, Carter Market, Carter Planet, uh, Dark Market, and Carter.su. Uh, those were the five um, that, that, I, that I remember being on, uh, that I remember advertising on, that I remember it eventually um, selling uh, fraudulent credit cards on because uh, I became a vendor. Um, as, essentially where I made all my money uh, was just vending um, fraudulent credit cards. But so I'm on the internet and I'm browsing and like I said, I'm reading tutorials about all these different scams. And that's when I kind of fucking came across carding, you know? And I think the very first, um, very first tutorial I had read on carding was on um, virtual carding. And it was, you know, basically you get the information that's um, not, physically encoded to the card but that's you know basically on the card um, so basically it's the credit card number expiration date uh, the first name the last name the CVV which is the three digit code in the back of the card and the person's first name last name billing address um, this information is hacked online and then resold uh, on these forums so I would purchase that information uh, and then I would you know kind of cloak my identity online, uh, my IP address using, um, you know, back in the day, it was like I would had a Russian VPN services that I would use um, on top of like a SOX 3 or a SOX 4 or SOX 5 proxies, uh, you know, to kind of mask my IP online and, and kind of kind of spoof my IP because what I would do is like say the credit card that I want to use is based out of, I don't know, Tacoma, Washington. So I would you know, it was kind of hard sometimes, but I would figure out a way to get an IP address uh, from Tacoma, Washington, and I would use the VPN service to route all of my internet traffic through that VPN to make it look like I was in Tacoma, Washington, because I was using the credit card whose billing address was in Tacoma, Washington. Now, when you go to a website and you say you purchased something online, they have all of this background uh, analytical data that they can analyze uh, on the purchase. They know where your IP address is. Uh, and then, you know, say, so say you're in California and you're making a purchase on a website with a credit card that's from Tacoma, Washington, like that, all that information just doesn't jive. So you're not going to, the purchase isn't going to go through. So what I used to do is I used to make it look like my IP address was, like say I was in Tacoma, Washington, I was using that credit card from Tacoma, Washington. Uh, but I would send whatever I was like, trying to mail to myself as like a gift, you know, and another, you know, 
real simple way, even kind of it's like old school way is basically just phoning in orders. Like a lot of people, like a lot of companies don't expect people to phone in orders anymore. So instead of like using the internet to like, you know, process the sale, whereas, you know, whereas it's like, it's, it's a cold calculating algorithm that's either going to give you a green light or a red light. People are more susceptible to kind of social engineering. And, you know, I've been a, a grade A professional bullshitter my entire fucking life because my survival's meant on it. Uh, whereas your normal ever, average everyday person kind of, uh, you know, you can see the physical anxiety in them if they even have to tell a little white lie. Um, when me, I can fucking tell a massive lie uh, with a smile on my face and look, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to tell I'm lying uh, if I wanted to fool you is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, I, people are more susceptible to this kind of uh, manipulation. So I would, I would sometimes I would call the order in and give them the credit card number over the phone and have it fucking mailed as a gift or something. So I, that's how I initially got into like the carding, um, you know, world. I was just doing virtual carding. And I remember um, it was just getting to the point to where like I, I didn't really have, um, I was running out of addresses to mail things to and like the success rate that I was having, um, it was kind of just declining, uh, you know, like a lot of companies were just getting hip to the fraud because, uh, they were just getting such massive amounts of fraud. So they were changing, you know, all of their, uh, security protocols on how they process transactions, um, you know, with, they will only ship to the billing address of the credit card. No questions, uh, you know, no, you know, there's no negotiating that. Um, so that kind of killed a lot of the online carding. And that's when I kind of like made the transition into actual physical carding, which is like um, actually walking into a brick and mortar business and uh, using a physical credit card uh, to, you know, purchase goods um, using somebody else's bank account, uh, obviously. Now, the way this kind of operation works is, say, every time you go to, say, you know, Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, you know, Target, anywhere where you use that pin, uh, chip, or you swipe your card, um, that information is, is subsequently saved on a server somewhere, um, you know, and held. Now, you know, what kids do that are in fucking, like, most of my experience, a lot of the kids that hack this shit have been out of Eastern Ukraine, Russia, Eastern Europe. Uh, you know, that's where all the clever, not, you know, to say that there aren't clever hackers in the U.S. that haven't. Um, you know, breached any of these these major um, these major networks because there have been many breaches. I mean, Target had one five or six, seven years ago, eight years ago, where it was like forty million fucking uh, you know data leaked from forty million debit card numbers hit the fucking market or whatever. So you hear about these data breaches all the time. You probably just don't think twice about it. Um, so what's happening is is these kids are hacking this data, which is just basically the raw track information that's encoded on your physical debit card. Okay, this information um, allows you to allows the POS machine, the point of sale machine, to communicate with the uh, bank that's issuing the funds and allowing that transaction to take place to process the sale to allow you to receive your goods in layman's terms. That's how the, the, the credit cards operate. Now, say I were to say if I were to buy some of this information, um, say now I buy, buy this illicit information, which is called dump information. That's the fucking terminology for it. There's all kinds of, of terminology that you're going to hear. And I'll explain uh, it a little bit to you. So dump is the actual physical dump information uh, from the card. Uh, it's basically what that is. There's track one information, track two information. Um, now, if when I say track one and track two, uh, I'm talking about if when you take a credit card and you, you scan it through like a MSR 206 reader and you have a laptop in front of you, um, the software that reads the debit card information on the track or even the pin uh, is going to come up as different lines of code. So when I say track one information and track two information, I mean track one is the first line of code you see when you swipe a debit card. Track two is the second line of code you see when you swipe a debit card. The first line or track one information of the physical debit card is the basic information that is on the physical card itself. In that line of code, you're going to see the whole entire credit card number. You're going to see the expiration date. You're going to see the name, first name, last. Yeah, 
last name first, first name last, and then like a string of, I think like nine ones, and then like, uh, like a random string of like four or five digits at the end. That's the track one information. The track two information uh, is a basic, you know, string of information that uh, it allows, like I said, the POS machine to kind of process the sale or process the transaction. Now, this information is basically hacked. The track one and track two information, like I, like I just previously um, explained to you, is hacked and then resold to people like either me who buy this information. Okay, now that's the first step of it. The second step of it is the actual physical debit card itself. Because without the physical debit card itself, you have absolutely, this information is completely useless. You can't use it online. The only thing you can do is resell it to somebody else who then is going to use it to encode to a debit card. The second part of this operation is the actual physical uh, credit cards themselves. Now, the physical credit cards themselves, those need to be manufactured. Um, you can't just take uh, anybody's credit card and write debit card information to it. You can, but it's only usable at certain places for certain things. So let's say you go to, let's say you go to Target and you you walk back there and you got your, you got, you're all full of fucking, you know, a, you got all your confidence in you and you're walking there and you go back and you get a laptop or you get a fucking TV or whatever like that. And you're thinking, yeah, I'm just going to fucking get in this car. They're going to swipe it. It's going to be all good. I'm going to walk about it here. Well, what a lot of people don't understand, what a lot of newbies don't understand, a lot of people that just don't understand what the fuck they're doing is, Certain stores have certain fail safes uh, for exactly these instances because of so much of this credit card fraud. Especially like Target. Target has a $300 fucking fail safe limit. So say you want to purchase something over $300 from Target and you're using a credit card or a debit card. The person behind the cashier counter, once you swipe your debit card where, where you're standing at your little pad at your POS machine, they have to physically ask you for your card because they have to type in the lad. They have to look at your, your debit card. The last four digits that are on your debit card, they have to type into their point of sale machine to allow the point of sale machine to verify the information that's on the physical debit card corresponds with the information that's on the physical track two information or track. I'm sorry, track one information that's written to the, the actual physical debit card. If these things two if these two things don't match, then the point of sale machine automatically flags the fucking the purchase and shuts it down immediately. So you can go get a random debit card and you can write a dump information to it and you can go and use it anywhere you want to. But if they if they, they have to physically verify the last four digits of that card, just like they do with any major purchase at any major store then you're up shit's creek. So, you know, what a lot of what a lot of these guys do were doing is they were actually physically uh, manufacturing manufacturing fraudulent uh, counterfeit credit cards. And so it's like I said, it's two parts of the operation. The, the first part is you purchasing these numbers that the, the you know these people hack um, you know from the servers. The second part of the, the operation is actually buying the physical plastic from these other vendors. Now, once you have these two pieces of these two pieces, uh, it, it's with one very um, inexpensive piece of equipment, you can then write this physical card information to this physical debit card. Now you can go wherever you want. I can walk into Saks Fifth Avenue and I can card a $5,000 handbag if I want to. And there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, they can take the card, they can look at it, they can stick it under a black light. You know what I mean? They can fucking, they can look at, as long as your ID, your, your ID now your ID has to be legit too. Your driver's license uh, has to match the, the debit card, um, which, you know, there's people who make those as well, which I ended up making debit cards uh, myself. So, you know, it's two parts of the operation. So once you have these two pieces, like I said, and this little piece of, of equipment, uh, you basically have your own debit card. And that's what I was doing. Once I graduated from um, using the, when I grad, well, after, well, let me see what I do. After I graduated basically from doing virtual carding to the uh, physical carding, this is, uh, you know, basically what I got into. Um, now, I would purchase all of these cards online from, from vendors. I would purchase the dumps and then I would purchase the plastic or sometimes 
uh, you know, plastic vendors would sell dumps and coated on the cards, as pa packages. Like it was all, it all depended on who you were dealing with on what forum and, 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 you know, what the day of the week was. So I was buying, I was buying plastic and I was buying dumps and I was encoding and I would go out to the stores and I would get laptops, big screens, you know, PS4s, Xboxes, PS3s or whatever it was back then. Uh, I'd get these big ticket uh, you know, electronic items, I would store them, I would list them on eBay, Craigslist, and then turn them for cash and pay my bills. You know, simple as that. I didn't have to work. Um, and this, you know, initially was a, a great fix um, for the situation I had gotten myself into. And I, like I said, now I'm able to kind of pay off, I'm starting to pay off my student loans. Uh, you know, my, my debt's being paid down, uh, my bills are being taken care of, my car note's being taken care of, and I got a little bit of extra. Not to mention, now, I'm not even fucking spending my own cash, I'm just using fucking these credit cards for everything. Like, anytime I gotta go fill my car up, I'll use a card. Anytime I gotta go to the grocery store, I'll use a card. Anytime I wanted to go buy, like, some sneakers or some jewelry or anything like that, I would go and use a card. You know, and this went on for, I'd say like a solid, like from, from the very, from like when I very first started doing virtual carding all the way up until I started, uh, you know, got into doing the physical carding and going to the stores and selling the merchandise and all that shit. I'd say we're in somewhere like around probably 2007 now, early 2007, late 2006, 2007, and I'm trying to think of the, uh, the chain of events now. Um, I think that I just, I, I, I was getting ran out of stores. Um, you know, I was having all these, these, these incidents where I would go to try and use the card, um, and say they, somebody just sold me a bunch of bad dumps. So it, it, listen, in this world, there are, all these guys are fucking shysters. I mean, you can, you could order cards and dumps. You could work with a guy for a year and he's never done you wrong. And then all of a sudden, one day he just starts ripping you off. Like period, that's just how these motherfuckers work. Like they'd build up a base, they'd fucking, they'd deal with fucking 100 people for a year and do everybody right and then all of a sudden, something happens in their life where they get fucking jammed up. Now all of a sudden, now I got 100 people I can rip off and they don't know who I am. Now I can do the big dirty, get me some cash and then you know do whatever. I can. So I, that's, I think that was the mentality of a lot of these guys. So, you know, um, I don't know what fucking point I was trying to make. Um, was trying to make with that. Oh yeah, these guys are fucking scumbags. Like you can't, you know, you can't trust any of these guys. So one guy sold me like a bullshit base of dumps. He sold me like, I don't know, like a thousand, two thousand fucking dumps or, or something like that. And, but what he had done is he had sold that same base of dumps to probably 15 fucking people. So all of these fucking dumps are being written and being used in multiple places all over the fucking country. Uh, at the same time. So all of these cards are all flagged now for fraud. So anytime you go to use one now, it's an automatic fucking, the error that comes up on the screen that the, the cashier see is call, hold, or hold card, call, or pick up card, or lost, stolen, or, 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 or something along those lines. It was one of those five error messages. So what's happening now is I'm getting fucking chased out of stores and all kinds of crazy fucking shit's happening to me, you know? Oh. And so, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell this, I'm going to tell this story. I've told this story uh, so many times that and I'm kind of tired of talking about it, but I'm going to tell it anyway because it's fucking hilarious. And this is, and I'm going to use, kind of use this story to transition to like the next level of, of my whole operation and like, you know, why I decided actually to, you know, take it to the next level. Um. So me and my little brother, my little brother, Chris, um, you know, poor fucking kid, he's extremely intelligent. Um, you know, my brother's always been, uh, I feel my younger brother at that, I've always feel like he's been light years ahead of me, um, you know, intelligently, intelligent wise. Cause like I said earlier on, he's, a, he's, he's one of those people who can just figure shit out. You know, he's got, he comes up with original ideas. Uh, you know, he doesn't try and fucking, you know, plagiarize or counterfeit or use anybody else's ideas to reinvent something else. Like he's, you know, he's just one of those people, you know, he's a, he's a very smart guy, but I had him doing fraud with me, um, back in the early two thousands. And, uh, you know, cause I'm just, I'm manipulative and if I can, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so I had him doing fraud with me. He's, he's doing the carding shit, you know, like back when I was doing like the physical carding, he would, um, 
he would do the carding with me. And so I think one day uh, I needed to pay rent. I think rent was coming up. So I needed a laptop. Like I needed him to uh, come out with me and help me cart a laptop from Walmart. And I think the reason why I needed him uh, was because he had the ID with his picture on it that matched the uh, credit card or that matched the debit cards that we were using. Now, this is back before I started making debit cards, driver's licenses and shit. So we were, we were buying them and he, he's the one that had, uh, you know, the matching identity. So he was going to be, he was, I was going to go with him all the way up to the counter, but he was going to have to be the one to give him the, the driver's license and all that shit. So we get to Walmart, um, you know, we get back there, we get the laptop, we get to the counter, you know, the guy, it's just an old, he looks like just an old stubborn bastard now that I, I kind of, in retrospect, uh, you know, when you, you always, when you're doing these things, you always kind of try and uh, choose your cashier, you know, wisely. And I always had a rule, you know, that I would only uh, try cashiers that were like young people or, uh, or foreigners, like foreign people, you know, they didn't want any fucking problems. They were just, you know happy enough to have their fucking job and the young kids uh they really don't give a fuck you know so they weren't trying to hold they're not trying to hold your debit card and call fucking none of that shit like if you just ask you know uh, firmly enough for the debit card back they usually give it back to you but those old fucking you know those old bastards that are just you know stubborn as fuck you know those old ex-military assholes that are working at are working at walmart for fucking fun because they don't have anything else to do uh those are the wrong motherfuckers to try and coincidentally on this day just happened to be one of those um one of those types of people behind the counter and so i give we give him the debit card we give him the id he swipes the, the debit card he looks at the id he takes them and then this is when i knew something this is when i knew it was starting that something was going south as he took the debit card and the id he put them together and he stuck them underneath the counter like this and he picked up the phone and he says we got a code red back in the electronics and I immediately fucking turned around, did an about face, and I started walking towards the front door. I get on my phone, I play like I, I got a fucking phone call. And I look back, and my brother's still standing there at the counter. I'm like, fuck. So I, I, I immediately know that these three calling for backup. So they're expecting, they, they probably have had a meeting or some shit, and they're expecting this type of, of situation, you know. So I'm walking towards the front door. I just, I lose my little brother. Like, fuck it, I'm walking, bro. You see me walking, you gotta walk too. You know, I can't fucking drag you physically so i lose them you know i'm walking and i get to the front doors as soon as i get to the front doors and they open i hear flip-flops because my brother is fucking wearing these goddamn thong uh abercrombie and fitch fucking thong flip-flops these foam piece of shit flip-flops should have been wearing his fucking running shoes wasn't we get to the front door the doors slide open here my brother, little brother comes blowing past me he's got two guys fucking chasing after him and listen when he's running he looks back like this and he's looking, I don't know if he's looking at me or he's looking at the two guys chasing him, but the look of sheer absolute fucking terror on this kid's face, I will never forget the look of that ever in my life. And that's when it hit me in my stomach. Like, yeah, I fucked up. Like this kid's, he's never been in jail before ever. We're in some shit now. Um, I got away. I fucking, then one of the guys tried to grab me. He got me, he, he grabbed my shirt and like, I was able to knock his hand away and make it out of the parking lot. Came back like an hour, two hours later, I got my car, uh, drove home and, um, you know, got everything out of my apartment, got all fucking paranoid. I was on the, on the internet all night watching my brother get moved around from fucking county jail to county jail to county jail. Um, you know, finally, and, and soon as the fucking bail bonds been opened up in the morning, I got on bail bonds. I got him bonded out of jail. Long story short is, uh, I was just like turned off from in-store carding. Like I was just so fucking tired of, you know, getting declines and, um, you know, going out all day long and carding shit. And it was just like, it, in the beginning it was fucking fun. Uh, cause you get this initial rush because you can like, when you're just doing it to buy shit for yourself, it's fucking fun. Cause you can go to the mall and you can just, you know, kind of browse around and be like, ah, let me buy these shoes. I like this shirt. Let me fucking match all this, you know, the hat. And then you pay for it all with the fucking stolen credit card. Um, you know, but when you're doing it and you know you got to turn a profit and you know I need to hit X amount of dollars because I've got these, this, this amount of bills I have to pay this month. So when you go in and you have a bad day and you know, I know I need to get five 60 inch TVs. Like I need these 60 inch Samsung TVs because I know I can get, they retail for 1300 each, but I know I can get, if I don't open the box, I can get between eight and $900 for them each. So I know I need five of these today. 
I have to get five of these today because I have to fucking pay. This car note's coming up. This is coming up. And then when you go out and you can only get two because all your fucking cards get declined and somehow you got lucky and you were able to get two. So now you got to go back home. You got to fucking all the cards that you have no work. And it's not like I was making cards at this time. So I couldn't just fucking make a bunch of cards. Like, so now I got to call my guy. I got to fucking take cash, more cash, because it's not like you can get a refund for cards that don't work. The shit don't work like that. Like there's no fucking guarantee. You know, so now I'm fuck. I'm spending more money. So now I can now I now I don't have to get five, but because I have to spend more money and get more cards, I have to get seven more fucking TVs instead of five more. Now I got to get seven more. So now it's just like you get put under the stress. Like I have to fucking these cards have to work, and it's like a whole fucking thing. And I was over it. Like I was just fucking over it. You know what I mean? Just fucking done over with it. And that's when I remember. I remember I was sitting there one night thinking like there has to be another way. Like it, like it was, it, it was right after my brother had gotten arrested and, you know, I had a little bit of money put away. So I had a little bit of a cushion and I was thinking of, you know, different ways I could put like a different spin, uh, on this whole thing, you know, on, on what I'm doing. And I don't remember what triggered the memory, but I was maybe watching something on TV or maybe it was just like my thought process at the time. And I remember, uh, I remember watching something. I remember something somebody had, I had read or somebody had told me uh, about the, uh, back in like the 1800s during the gold rush. Um, you know, you would think that these guys who were, you know, were pulling all of this gold out of the ground, you would think that these guys were rich. Um, but they, but they, they just weren't, you know, these guys were, um, you know, spending all their money at the whorehouses and at the bar and there were you know brokers coming down there and ripping people off for the gold and there was like all this shady shit and you had to work hard and these guys were dying out there fucking mining all this gold he said it wasn't the guys making that were mining the gold that was making all the money it was the guys that were down there selling pickaxes you know to the guys that were mining the gold that were fucking that were you know essentially they were making the money and that's when I had that aha moment. That's when it came to me. And I'm like, I can just be a vendor. Like I can just, at the very least, I can, you know, make my own debit cards and shit and or figure it out, you know, cause I, I'm not a hacker, you know, let's, I just, I knew that wasn't going to be, um, you know, I was never, that was never my strong suit. You know, I just, I never, I never learned. I was never around anybody that was a hacker. Um, you know, I just, I, I didn't really understand, um, coding and I, I wasn't good at math and I know a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, just different equations, you know, math, matter, you know, algebra and shit like that. And I just, I didn't have a knack for it, but what I did have a knack for was graphic design and the, uh, you know, manipulation of, of images, um, which was, you know, right up the fucking alley that I needed to manufacture fraudulent credit cards. You know, it was just using Adobe Photoshop to figure out the templates, uh, you know, and I had worked in a print shop in Miami, fresh out of fucking college. So I kind of understood, you know, the YMCK ribbon printing processes and like the different dye sublimination fucking transfer processes for inks. And like, I just knew that from working uh, at this print shop. So I kind of took that little bit of knowledge and the knowledge I had of graphic design and media arts uh, combined with the now knowledge that I have of the intricate knowledge I have of credit cards and like the manufacturing process of credit cards because I had read tutorials. So I was kind of just like I had all of these. I had like a pretty profound understanding of all of these three different uh, segments. And so I just combined them all and I just decided to start manufacturing uh, fraudulent credit cards. Um, you know, and at this time, believe it or not, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on in the background of like the carding world. You know, uh, so uh, Brett Stevens was running Shadow Crew. And he had just gotten, um, you know, arrested uh, or and he was actually in turn working for the feds, uh, setting people up on Shadow Crew and on the Internet and getting people fucking put in jail after he had started one of the probably one of the most fucking uh, first and original prolific fucking underground carding forums and, you know, just kind of marketplace for illicit information, which kind of blew my mind. So then he goes to jail uh, and, and he gets caught. Uh, and then there was, you know, two more kind of players uh, in the scene that were like, you know, vending cards and controlling the forums, which was Max Butler and Christopher Aragon. Uh, now, these were a couple of guys out of Las Vegas. One of them was a hacker. You know, Christopher Aragon was the guy who was making the plastic. And, you know, they had this whole ring. They were going out and getting high end shit and fencing the goods, uh, you know, and, and, and 
Max Butler kind of did this hostile takeover of all the all of the carding forums. He pretty much hacked them all, uh, locked out all of the admin, and then kind of corralled all the users together. Sent out emails saying that basically, uh, you know, this is what it is now, and I'm running the show. So then those two guys went to prison uh, and, and were gone. Uh, you know, so essentially there were a few guys left in Europe that were vending, but. You know, Europeans are not reliable at all when it came to vending anything. Like, you know, they would rip you off or it would take fucking two months for you to get what you ordered from them. And then it would, it would be some bullshit. So, like, all of these things happening at once and then me kind of co just starting to come into the game uh, left this vacuum. Uh, if you will, in the in the credit card fraud space, like there was nobody vending plastic, nobody reliable anyway vending. I mean, there was a few people vending plastic, um, but you know, it, it, there was nobody reliable vending plastic, and, and all the guys that were vending plastic were, you know, like I said, in Europe, and you had to worry about customs and all that shit. So. You know, me being the, the young entrepreneur that I fucking am, I went ahead and I just filled that fucking gap. I filled the space. I, I figured out how to manufacture credit cards. I um, I read all of the tutorials. I took a trip to the DMV under the guise of I lost my driver's license because I wanted to see, you know, what model printers they were using to manufacture the driver's license. I did the same thing at the bank. I went to go set up a bank account. Uh, and literally, they printed the cars right there at the bank. This was... Um, TD Bank, I believe, uh, here in South Florida, they actually had right behind the desk where you would set up your account, they would print you like a, a temporary debit card. So I seen the model of machine that they were using. It was a Fargo HDP 5000, which I ended up getting two of those. Um, you know, so I just, I figured out, you know, it, coincidentally, um, what kind of equipment you needed, you know, the pieces of equipment, and I, I ordered all of that. Uh, you know, and then it was just a trial and process, a, you know, prior, God damn it. Then it was just a, you know, a trial and error uh, process, um, setting up the equipment and, you know, printing cards, learning how to change the different, uh, the DPI range to get, you know, the images to fit the cards, uh, you know, and there was just different hurdles. You know, I had to figure out the hologram situation, which uh, apparently in China, they don't give a fuck about counterfeit. You can contact them and they'll fucking, they'll, they'll counterfeit anything for you. Um, so I, you know, I found a Chinese dude who would counterfeit the Visa and MasterCard uh, foil holograms, and I was getting rolls of like ten thousand uh, in the mail. I was also getting sheets of the holograms for the driver's licenses. So each driver's license, if you pull your driver's license out, it's got like a it's got like a film over it that's got like so the state of Florida's got like the actual physical state of Florida that fluoresces. Uh, and the light, uh, I was having those made. So I was getting sheets of, uh, of the ones for the driver's license. I had them for every state, Pennsylvania, Florida, California, Colorado, fucking Michigan. I was had Chicago. I had South Dakota. I had fucking, I had all the states and I had the, the, you know, the plastic to go on them to make them all, you know, look legitimate. So once I sourced that from China and I was able to figure out kind of, you know, how to, you know, get a product that, looked like it was issued from a financial financial institution um it was fucking game over after that uh it, it was absolute fucking game over i um you know once my product got out there i you know i initially figured out um you know who's doing all of the vending who who are the big fucking vendors on these on these boards so i went through and i systematically ordered cards from uh every single plastic vendor that was vending you know, and I did this after I'd already started making plastic, but before I started uh, vending plastic, because I wanted to see what the competition's, you know, what the product in the competition was, and I wanted to see how my product compared to their product. So I ordered uh, ordered plastic from almost every vendor uh, on the internet uh, or that I could find uh, on the forum, the big ones anyway. You know, the guys that were doing you know bulk orders and shit. And dude, a lot of these, I could see when I got the cards, I could see that. I knew what printers they were using. Like, I knew what printers they were using. I knew what process they were using for their fucking embossing, their tipping. Like, their, their holograms weren't even that good. They were using sticker fucking holograms that were stickers. Like, mine were heat press. Um, you know, they were just inferior products. So, I basically sent out an email to all of my competitors, uh, essentially letting them know that they were all fucked. Uh, because I'm the man now. So I pretty much took over the entire uh, underground uh, vending for 
plastic and, and, and driver's licenses. I, I was the de facto go-to guy from essentially 2000 and probably late 2006 until 2009 for uh, fraudulent credit cards and driver's licenses, um, you know, on all these forums. And because I had been on all of these carding forums for like a year and a half, two years now, I was, I, I was cool with all of the admin on all of them. Well, not cool, like, you know, we're having beers and shit, but like they knew who I was because I had been posting, I had been reading tutorials, I had been leaving feedback, um, you know, and I had been purchasing dumps, I had been purchasing plastic, and I would go and I'd leave feedback for different vendors and, you know, whatnot. Um, so, you know, they knew who I was. So I, I contacted... Um, I contacted the admin and I had asked if I could pay and so that they could run banner ads for my service on the top of all of their forums so that no matter you know what page you were browsing, no matter what subject you were browsing, you would see you know my U.S. Plastico, which was my arrogant fucking name, uh, was you know, United States Plastic Company was short for it. It was a U.S. Plastico and then my uh, ICQ or whatever chat fucking because back in the day, that's what we were using was fucking uh, IRC uh, chats, which was like an encoded, like an encrypted kind of end-to-end, -end, like real fucking, um, you know, um, uh, low-tech fucking primitive chat fucking, you know, communication service. And uh, so after I did that, um, you know, about a, like the first maybe three or four months I was vending, I didn't really get too many orders. I got maybe five here, two orders here, three orders here, four orders here. But as these orders went out, uh, my customer service was fucking impeccable, okay? These other fucking guys that were selling cards, you'd send them an email, and like five days later, you'd get a fucking, you'd get an email back at like three o'clock in the morning. Yo, bro. And that'd be it. And then you'd email them back, and it'd be another two fucking days before you could even buy any fucking plastic. So, you know, the customer service experience with these other guys was just absolutely fucking atrocious. And I think that's where I excel at because, listen, I kept my laptop open next to me on a fucking stool next to my bed with the volume turned all the way up so that if I got a fucking message or, or a customer complaint, I would wake up out of a dead fucking sleep at three o'clock in the morning because most of my customers were in different countries all over the world and different fucking time zones. So I'd have to deal with the problems. I'd either have to send them out new cards or walk them, you know, hold her hand and walk them through the bullshit. But it was these little extra things that I did that anybody else didn't did that, that they didn't do that brought me fucking that ended up me being ended up, you know, attributing, contributing to my success uh, eventually is what, is what I feel. I mean, this is my, you know, take on it. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'd wake up at three o'clock in the morning and a guy'd be I'd have five orders and I would just deal with them and I'd process them and I'd go back to sleep. You know. So once the word got out that, you know, this guy, his delivery time is on point, he's always fucking there when you message him, any problems, he's always there. Like once the word got out that I was a legitimate fucking plastics vendor and people would like get my shit and they would like post pictures of the actual cars that they received from me, and be like, yo, these are fucking hundred percent legit. They look like they came from the bank. Once that fucking got out and once people like realized who I was, um, I remember, I remember the day, I remember the day I woke up and I had 20 orders waiting for me, money already in the bank, already fucking paid for. I had 20 orders waiting on me, uh, which roughly equated to about $20,000, um, you know, because minimum order with me was, uh, it was a thousand dollars. Like I didn't nickel and dime. I wasn't selling, I'll sell you a card for $20. No, 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 no. You're going to spend $1,000 and you're going to get 100 debit cards. And I would work with you on the driver's licenses. I wouldn't give you 100 driver's licenses, but I would give you, you know, however many you need, 10, 15, 20. And so minimum order was like $1,000 with me. And I remember waking up, I had 20 orders already paid for, um, you know, which equated to like twenty something thousand dollars and up until this point in my life, I had never really seen any kind of money. Um, you know, even though even, I was making money with the, the graphic design shit, but that was coming in like checks and I was spending it and like I had shit being direct deposited out of my account, all my bills were being taken out. So I didn't really see that much money. And up until this part in my life, you know, I had seen maybe 5,000 here, 10,000 here. I, you know, maybe come, you know, come up on something, make a couple thousand over here, but I'd never really seen uh, any like a substantial amount of, of capital up until this point. And I remember that feeling when I seen that fucking twenty thousand dollars sitting there and I and I already had the I already had the cards printed so I didn't really have to do any work. I just had to stick them in the mail. Um, I remember after that I remember after, after that I remember that feeling like this is I can do anything. Like I just seen that 
my life was going to change at that point. Like I knew things were going to change at that point. Uh, and they did, you know, the orders just became more and more. And I just started selling more and more cards. Uh, I think at the very pinnacle of, of what I deem to be, you know, my success is I was doing probably like a hundred orders a month, uh, over a hundred orders a month. Uh, you know, so it's like a hundred thousand dollars over a hundred thousand dollars a month. Uh, I was doing it in just in sales uh, alone. Um, you know, and at this time I had begun dealing with, uh, a guy named who went by the screen name of shoulder surfer, uh, you know, and shoulder surfer would come and he would do now what I didn't know at this point, now I, what I believe to be at this point, I believe shoulder surfer was a, like a buffer for the Russian mob. Um, you know, so I think essentially what, uh, where a bulk of my orders were coming from were, uh, where there was the, was some kind of scam ring they had going on, uh, with the Russian mob. I learned a little bit later. And, um, you know, I just had such wild success with all of this that I could, I, you know, I lived a life that I could never even have imagined. You know, I, 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 I went from, you know, fishing sandwiches out of a 7-Eleven dumpster to, you know, making over $100,000 in a month manufacturing fraudulent credit cards. Um, you know, and this completely changed my life. I... I no longer worried about where my how my bills were going to get paid. I, I completely paid off all my student loans. My car was paid off. I went on vacations. I bought, um, you know, I'm a sneakerhead. I love fucking, you know, retro Jordans. Um, you know, so I had like 350 pairs of fucking sneakers. I had a room that was all just wall to wall, floor to ceiling fucking, you know, sneakers. Um, you know, I did, I just took a lot of vacations. I, um, you know, I just, I had, I had fun and I lived a carefree life for roughly five or six years. You know, I didn't really, I helped a lot of people out. I, I, you know, I, I lived a really good life and, you know, to lose all of that, um, you know, this is going to sound crazy, but to lose all of that, I, I kind of felt like it was more devastating than losing my freedom. You know, I, um, Let's go down that rabbit hole, shall we? Let's go. I'm going to walk you down. I'm going to take you through the entire, you know, day that I got caught. Um, I, um, I was in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and I was uh, in a small fucking town. I, I had met a girl in Fort Lauderdale and thought I was in love. We had a baby together. And we moved to Rock Hill, South Carolina, um, you know, and I'm figuring, you know, I can do what I do anywhere. You know, I didn't have anybody involved in what I was doing. I didn't have crews of people running around carding shit. Nobody knew that I was making credit cards. Nobody knew who I was. They, you know, they just seen me as U.S. Plastico, and that was it. I didn't brag to people, um, you know, about what I was doing because I, you know, I just don't trust people. I don't. I've never really had friends, um, you know, per se. Like I never really had like a group of friends like to hang around and shit. You know, like I've never had fucking like somebody who I can be like, that's my fucking homeboy. You know, I didn't have that growing up. So I didn't, you know, I like, I didn't really share what I was doing, um, you know, with too many people. So when the hammer fell, it was basically, it was just me, you know, which honestly ended up working in my benefit. Uh, you know, so, um, I'm in South Carolina, I'm in the small town, Rock Hill, South Carolina. And uh, I'm making credit cards. Uh, you know, I'm sending my orders out in the mail. I'm still traveling. I'm still doing my thing. You know, kind of living a carefree lifestyle. But you know, I, at this time, I have uh, my son uh, Nicholas is probably nine months old, ten months old, or something like that. Um, and uh, we got a nice condo. It was like in, in this development where they had just built all these townhomes, and I got us, you know, a nice townhome. We're living there, and. I was going to the same UPS store every, not every day, but, you know, to send all my orders out, I had to use the same UPS store because in Miami, you know, there's a UPS store every fucking five miles. You know, you could, you pull them up on your GPS and you could hit a different one every day for two months and you never had to visit the same UPS store. But coincidentally, in uh, the small town of South Carolina, there was two. You know, so I had to go between the two to you, or I would have to drive like an hour and a half, which I'm not, I wasn't willing to do, which in, in retrospect, uh, I probably should have just, you know, took the drive. Um, but I just, I wasn't willing to do so. And in my mind, I'm like, you know what? My packages are sealed and I, you know, I pay for the postage my own way. I have a 
you know, the UPS system. I won't get into that. But all I do is I go to the store, I give them the package, they scan it, it goes in the outgoing mail. That's fucking supposed to be the process. It's that fucking easy. I take my package to the UPS store, they go beep, and they set it in a box that the UPS store guy comes and picks up on his way out. The old man at the UPS store in Rock Hill, South Carolina, decided one day that he was going to take it upon himself to open up one of the packages that I had brought to the store to send out. This motherfucker, this nosy old motherfucker, cut open one of my packages and found the fucking credit cards that I was sending out. He calls the Postmaster General. The Postmaster General comes down, gets the cards. The Postmaster General then contacts the Secret Service. The Secret Service come down to the, po to the UPS store box uh, every day. And they just wait for me to come. They sit in the parking lot and they wait for me to come back. Because I, would, I, would, I was there every other day, you know, twice a week, three times a week. These motherfuckers sat in the parking lot every single day from the time it opened to the time it closed, waiting for me to, waiting for me to get there, the, the Secret Service did. Uh, and then one day, of course, I show up and, you know, uh, I actually get an email telling me that I had a package there waiting for me, um, which I did have a package there waiting for me. It was actually uh, some, uh, this, I was working on a new technique to bypass the, uh, the fluorescent um, security feature on the credit cards because the credit cards, all credit cards, if you stick them under a black light, they have a V on the Visa and then on the MasterCard, there's a big M and a C and then on the back, there's different uh, black light features that only show up under ultra, ultraviolet. And I needed a sep to, to do this process, I needed a whole separate printer. I needed, I think, like a Zebra printer because a Zebra printer, um, the Fargo printers didn't print UV didn't print UV images. Like they, they said they did, they advertised that they did, but I can never get it to fucking work the way I needed it to work. The only way I, the only way I could get it to work that I needed it to work was buying a whole separate like $3,000 fucking dollar printer and these ribbons that were like $250 each, but it allowed me to achieve the, the effect that I, that I was going for. It allowed me to put down the ultraviolet, but it was just an expensive process. So I was I was trying to um, perfect this new thing where I was just going to use UV ink and a stamp. So I had ordered these stamps from fucking Mexico at this fucking stamp place that cuts the rubber and, and any fucking shape or whatever you want. So I had all the rubber stamps cut to match the uh, the UV uh, security features and I was just going to hit them with UV ink and just stamp all these motherfuckers. Let the UV ink dry and now I'm saving, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month or whatever it is. Not that I fucking needed to because I had millions of fucking dollars anyway. But, you know, that's just me. That's where my, you know, cost accounting, I'm always, you know, I, I approach everything. I look at the entire world through financial lenses. Uh, I always have. I, 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 approach, I approach relationships that way. You know, what's going to be my ROI uh, on this situation? You know, my return on investment. If I invest uh, time and energy into this woman, uh, you know, what's going to be the return that I'm going to get out of it? Uh, and I know that's, you know, be that what it may, that's just how I look at things. That's how I look at everything. So in my mind, cost accounting. Uh, so I, anyway, that's the package I had coming in. I had the fucking stamps coming in. Uh, so I got an email, and so I show up to pick up my package. And I'll, listen, I'll give it to the old man. He played it cool as a motherfucking cucumber. This old bitch, fucking, I walked in. He had a smile on his face. He was all chipper. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't, he didn't have a fucking ounce of, like, you know, I couldn't tell. Like, his body language wasn't that of somebody who was... Uh, you know, about to bust a guy with the Secret Service sitting in the fucking parking lot, you know, or else I would have picked up on it because I am very uh, uh, intuitive of people's body language when, when the vibe's off, when something doesn't feel right. Like, I always get these fucking feelings and that's how I've been able to, like, narrowly fucking escape a lot of shit my entire life, but... This time I didn't. I didn't feel anything. Nothing felt off about the transaction. I walked in. It was a normal day. Like nothing, nothing about that day was really off, man. Like I just, I had no idea this was going to happen. Just fucking happened. He gives me, he gives me the package. I sign for it. I'm like, cool. He plays it cool. I play it cool. I'm like, all right. I grab the package. I turn around. I'm going, just as I get to the door, I'm reaching and I go to reach for the door and it, and it pulled open and I missed the handle. And I, and, I, and I take a step back, two steps back, and there's two guys coming in, so I kind of got to step out of the way. And I wasn't looking at their faces because, 
you know, I'm just trying to get to get to my fucking car and get the fuck out of here. You know, I'm not paying attention to who's coming through the door, but it's two big guys. And of course they got the jeans on with the polo t-shirts tucked into the fucking jeans. And I seen a badge and a gun. They were, you know, like I said, polo jeans and fucking t-shirt, but I seen a badge and a gun on both of them. And even then, and even then in my mind, like I, I, I was just so confident in what I was doing. Like even when I seen that, it, it still didn't register with me that I'm fucked. Like it didn't register that they're here for me and I'm going to fucking jail. Like it didn't even, for a split second, I was just like trying to get past them to move out the door. Like I thought they were just coming there for whatever reason. Like I was trying to like, trying to let them get out of the way to try to get to the door. And then when I like, tried to go to the door one of them stepped in front of the door and they said mr pearson which was the name i had been using i was using a name called ryan pearson at this point uh it's, my driver's license said ryan pearson my vehicles were registered under ryan pearson my bank account was under ryan pearson the condo was under ryan pearson uh that's just who i was and so they said ryan pearson i said yeah they said uh well we need to uh have, have a conversation with you about um you know what you've been sending out of here and i'm like fuck and I'm like, well, what do you, I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, you know what? Let's, let's just go in back and, and just have a conversation. Let's just, you're not under arrest. Let's just, let's just step in the back room and we'll, we'll have a call. We'll have a talk. And I'm like, well, fuck, you know, maybe I can talk my way out of this whole fucking thing. You know what I mean? I do have the gift of gab. I've always been able to wiggle my way out of, you know, much serious, more situations. Um, so I'm like, fuck it. Let's do it. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go have, 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 have the conversation. We get back there. They said, um, we got your package. Um, we know what you've been sending out of here and, um, you know, it's, it's definitely illegal, you know, so, you know, either you're going to cooperate with us or uh, and tell us, you know, what we need to know, or you're going to go to jail. And then right when he said that, I'm like, or I'm going to go to jail. And I was like, I leaned back in my chair. I was like, I'm not going to go to jail today. I'm not under arrest. They're like, well, you're going to have a, a court date eventually. Like you're going to have to go to court, but he's like, if you just, you know, tell us what we want to know and, and, you know, be completely honest with us. And then they gave me that whole spiel about, you know, Oh, well, if you lie to us, we're going to know you're lying and uh, it's going to be 10 times worse for you. And you're blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, okay, okay. I got to listen at this point. They don't really know who I am. Um, they don't really know what I've been doing or the extent of what I've been doing, because if they did, we'd be having a completely different fucking conversation right now. And I'd be in handcuffs. Um, you know, so I, now I'm like, okay, now I can, now I got a little bit of wiggle room. I was like, if I can just get away from this situation right now, I've got a car in a storage unit with like $120,000 in the fucking car, a new fucking driver's license, a new identity. I've got clothes. You know, I listen, I used to keep a fucking escape plan at all times. You know, I'd go to Walmart, I'd buy like a, you know, a couple packs of fucking tank tops, a couple packs of brand new boxer shorts, a couple, pa couple big packs of socks, uh, you know, a couple packs of white t-shirts, a couple packs of black t-shirts, uh, you know, a bunch of like, I go to like Foot Locker, I'd get like five or six, seven, eight, ten pairs of like, you know, Jordan shorts or basketball shorts, and I'd have a fucking duffel bag of all this shit in the trunk of a car with money and all that shit in a storage unit, you know, kind of as like a fail safe. And I'm thinking to myself, like, dude, if I can just get the fuck away from this situation, if I can just lie my way out of this situation real fast, I can get to the storage unit. These motherfuckers are never going to see me. I'm going to up and vanish like a goddamn fart in the wind, and that's going to be the end of it. Um, you know, so we went through the whole rigmarole. They were like, you know, who are you? What's your name? And I was like, and that's when I was like, man, do I have to? Because they were like, because they were like, we we gave we checked the the name that you gave us and we pulled the dmv file for that name and that driver's license number and we know you're not ryan pearson so they had ryan the real ryan pearson's name social security number they had his picture and everything on like a clipboard when they were there so it's like i couldn't bullshit my way and tell them i was ryan pearson so i had to fucking give him my real name uh, i had to tell him yeah my name's john boziak this is my date of birth this is my social security number <laughs> They jumped on the fucking, uh, they had Blackberries at this time. This wasn't even, this is pre-iPhone. Uh, they jumped on their Blackberries. They verified all the information. They got my, my, my um, like a picture of me from like an old mugshot or like my driver's license or something like that. And they verified it was me. Um, I didn't have all these tattoos uh, back then. I wasn't as heavily uh, tattooed as I am now, um, you know, back then. I had a few. I had, you know, um, had like maybe one here, one here, but I didn't, you know, I didn't look like this.
Um, so, you know, they basically, I, I basically minimized the fuck out of the situation. Uh, I told them, I said, yeah, okay, you got me. Uh, I'm printing credit cards. I've been selling them on the internet, uh, blank cards. I was like, nobody else is involved. It's just me. I've only been doing it for a few months. Um, because honestly, they didn't really know anything. All they knew was that the postmaster general caught some kid with a bunch of fucking fraudulent debit cards at a UPS store. They didn't know, they didn't have my internet history. They didn't know what fucking card or forums I'd been on. They didn't know how long I'd been doing it. Because like I said, if they did, we'd be having a completely different fucking conversation. So, okay, I minimized the fuck out of it. I told them basically, I, I gave them, I told them what I thought they knew without giving them too much of what they thought I didn't know, if that makes any fucking sense. Um, you know, so what they did was they fingerprinted me in the back of the UPS store. <whistles> fingerprinted me, all that shit. They took, took me outside of the UPS store, took my picture, had me turn aside, face us, all that bullshit. They put me in their car, drove me to my apartment, my condo, and they proceeded to completely fucking search my entire condo. Uh, they confiscated anything with removable storage. They took all my laptops. They took all my printers. They took my safe, which had like 5,000 cards already pre-printed in it. Um, I mean, this is crazy. I had weed at the house. I had like a fucking quarter pound of weed. They left it. I had multiple assault rifles. I had an AR-15. I had two fucking uh, Romanian uh, Wasser 10 AK-47s. I had a fucking, uh, I had two Smith & Wessons. I had a revolver. I had a fucking, uh, god damn, I had a, what else did I have? I had a bunch of motherfucking guns this time, so I was just going crazy buying guns. Uh, what else? I had a fucking, I had Springfield Arms, uh, 9mm, uh, XDM, uh, subcompact, whatever it is. But whatever, I had a bunch of guns. They didn't take the guns! They left all of the guns. They left the drug. They, what they told me, they said, we're not the ATF. We don't care about that. We just want the, all of the equipment that was used to perpetrate the crime that we're here for. I was like, all right, that's cool. So they left all the guns. They left all my ammunition. They left. They fucking didn't even take the ammunition. They took, I left everything. Um, and they took, and they like, they gave me a card and they were like, well, listen, we're going to be in contact. Um, we're going to give you a date and a time. You're going to have to come down to the uh, Secret Surfers headquarters in Columbia, South Carolina. And you're going to have to, you know, pretty much debrief. Uh, we're going to have a team there of people. Uh, you're going to have to tell the truth. And he's like, if you don't tell the truth, he's like, we're going to know. He's like, we need, we want all of your passwords. We want to know every forum that you've been on. We want to know, you know, all of your, 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 your contacts, people you've been selling cards to. Like, I had to turn all of this information over to them. Um, and, and not that they didn't already have it. I mean, they had all my computers, they had my hard drive, so they already had access to all of this information. So it's like, if I tried to lie and say that I didn't, they had the physical proof there saying that I did or saying that you were on this site because right here I can see, you know, on your fucking, you know, cause I kept impeccable records. Um, <laughs> I kept the fucking, oh, I kept fucking records. Like I was running a goddamn investment firm for Charles Schwab. You know, I had records of everything. Uh, which is coincidentally ended up coming back to bite me in the ass as well. Um, so, you know, initially, like I said, I had to go down to the Secret Service headquarters uh, in Columbia, South Carolina, and I had to give a statement, uh, you know, and I walk into this room and there's this fucking table full of fucking all these old heads. Uh, you know, you can tell that they had flown people in from like the head of like all of the like financial crimes units and like, um, you know, all of the guys who ran, say, like the cyber uh, division crime units for like Las Vegas, uh, you know, New York, uh, L.A., like all of these guys were flown in from all over the country. And I walk into this room and they had screenshots of all of my posts on all of the forums I had been on laid out in the middle of this table. They had all of these fucking screenshots of all of the fucking forums I had been on. I was like, oh my God, what the fuck? They had known, they, I mean, they had screenshots of uh, me being on a forum here, fucking posting here, posting there. They kept asking me questions. They were showing me pictures of people like, have you ever dealt with this person? And it was all Russians. It was always a Russian. They were like, do you speak Russian? I'm like, no, I don't um, speak Russian. They're like, do you code? I said, no, I'm not a coder. I'm not a hacker. You know what I mean? Like I gave them my background. I was like, listen, I'm an art, art major. I went to school for graphic design. I just figured out, I got into carding. I told them a little bit, like I got into carding, you know, virtual carding and shit. And I just kind of figured it out, blah, 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 blah. They were like, all right, um, that's enough for today. You can go home. They sent me home. <laughs> I fucking walked right out of there, dude. I couldn't believe it. I walked right out. They're like, oh, you're going to have a court date. 
you know, you're gonna have to go to court and uh, you're gonna have charges and that, but that's all gonna be figured out. And uh, yeah, that was it. I walked out of there and then I, 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 I immediately went home and um, Melissa, the girl I was with, uh, no longer wanted to be with me anymore because of whatever. I don't know if she thought maybe she was gonna get in trouble or you know they were gonna take our kid away, but her uh, solution to that situation was to uh, essentially tell me to go get fucked um, so that's what I did. I, I fucked off and I left South Carolina. I went to Michigan. Um, you know, it was like the summertime. I ended up going up to Michigan because I had a bunch of, uh, you know, I had a bunch of shit going on up there. Um, you know, I had to take care of with my driver's license and all that shit. And then, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for this court date that never, essentially never fucking came. You know, um, I'm out. I don't know what's going to go on. It, like a year passes and all my money's running down. Uh, I haven't got a court date yet. I have no warrants out for my arrest. I don't know what the fuck's happening. Um, you know, so in, in my mind, I'm just partying. Like I went down to my, I took off from, from Michigan. I went back to Miami and uh, I just, you know, proceeded to party. I was in Scarlet's Cabaret in fucking uh, uh, North Miami regularly. Uh, you know, I frequented all of the uh, degenerate, um, you know, dirty fucking South, South Florida fucking strip joints. I, I lived in that fucking that that subculture of of just cutthroat fucking pimps and fucking prostitutes and hookers and fucking dope. And uh, like I wasn't doing dr I wasn't doing I was doing a little bit of cocaine here and there because that just goes hand in hand with like being in Miami uh, and being in the club. Like I never like did copious amounts of cocaine. But yeah, I did. I would get like an eight ball and be like, you know fucking party for the weekend and shit like that because in my mind i'm going to prison like you know they got me on this massive fucking fraud like i'm probably gonna do fucking 10 15 20 years because you know up until this point um all of my charges have had been just as a youth or as a juvenile you know so i'd never really been in any serious trouble as an adult you know maybe one or two charges for shoplifting but that was it so I, in my mind i'm fucking for sure i'm fucked i'm doing a bunch of time in prison and so I just, I proceed to party. I, you know, a lot of my money would just went fucking to partying and buying bottles service. And, uh, you know, I was flying, I was flying on private, uh, private jets. I had a buddy of mine who he knew a service where you pay him like a hundred thousand dollars and you get like so many, uh, flight hours, um, you know, and you use in like anywhere you are, they have like, a, they'll send like a Lincoln town car to come pick you up and they'll take you to like Fort Lauderdale executive airport and you go right to the fucking air, airplane. They fly you out. And I used to fly into like McCarran and fucking Las Vegas and stay in Las Vegas for four or five days, fucking partying, doing cocaine. Uh, you know, just all your cliche fucking, you know, dumb, uh, ignorant fucking shit that people do when they get too much money and they, they, they have more money than they have sense, you know? And since I had never really done any of that my whole life, I was just like, fuck, now I can, you know, fuck it. I don't have a kid. Like, I'm not with my, my baby mom anymore. Like, I don't have family to support. Um, I'm going to prison. And so I just fucking went nuts. And I partied my fucking ass off. And after about a year of doing that, like, I just kind of came to my senses. And I met a girl uh, in Miami. And, like, I wanted we wanted to get married and, like, fucking... Like, and at this point I, I got down to like my last, like probably like 15, $20,000 and like, I didn't have that much money left. And so I'm like, well, fuck the only way I really know how to make money is fucking making cards. So what I do, I fucking, I geared up for another run. I, I went ahead and I, with a little bit of money I had left, I went and invested in more equipment. Uh, I, I sent out a few emails to a few people that I knew that I had been selling cards to before. I think one of the guys I had owed, I owed him like 1500 or 2000 cards or something like that. Because when I got busted, like I had orders waiting on me when I fucking got busted by the secret service and they, they took all my shit. So I reached out to this guy. I was like, listen, man, I'm going to make it good. I'm going to send you 2000 cards right now. And then, you know what I mean? Like fucking let everybody know I'm fucking back and let's get the orders rolling in. Um, so coincidentally, I ended up fucking going right back into it. I ended up making more cards. I think I ended up making like, uh, like another million and a half dollars or something like that over the course of maybe like the next nine uh, to 12 months. I made like another million and a half dollars, um, you know, and then fucking literally one day uh, I get pulled over and I'm thinking, um, 
you know, I'm thinking it's part of some kind of operation that's going on uh, at the time where it was called uh, Operation Open Market. It was a joint venture between the like Russian FSB, American Secret Service, American FBI. Like it was this whole task force because now this is around like 2009, um, almost 2010 now, um, where carding had exploded um from the time i had started doing it like i got in when nobody was doing it like i was probably i wouldn't say i was one of the first ones because i'm sure there were other people doing it but i was probably at one point in time the largest uh, manufacturer of fraudulent credit cards in the united states um hands down I, I i absolutely was just because of the sheer volume of cards i was printing and putting out i had to have been and so over the course of like you know five or six or seven years like it just became more mainstream and the kid like once the kids got a hold of it like once the school kids got a hold of it like then they just it blew the fuck up and everybody was doing it and like it was cool to be like a carter and now all these kids want to coin themselves as scammers and you got all these little young rappers that were born in like 1998 that were born in like 2002 2003 now they're all fucking scammers and you know what I mean? Like the whole thing is just taken on this whole cartoonish fucking pop culture Hollywood vibe to it. And it's just fucking retarded. You know what I mean? You got guys like uh, Bandman Kebo and fucking Lil TJ and fucking, you know, all these guys that, you know, I get it. They're rappers and they want to glorify the carding and, you know, talk about it. Like, but it's like, dude, I don't really give a fuck. Like I, I pioneered that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like I fucking I paved the way for all these fucking these these kids coming up now. And not not to say that pompously, like I give a fuck, because I really don't. You know, I really don't give a fuck. I, I care less. Um you know, but like I said, I'm part so now I'm partying like this. I said I went back into it and I made like another million and a half dollars. Um and at this time there was like this operation going on called Operation Open Market where they were infiltrating all of these fucking carding forums and they were shutting them all down. And I know a lot of this had probably to do with my case a year earlier because, you know, they figured out all of the carding forums. Maybe not. They probably already knew about them. But my case most certainly didn't fucking help um, all, of the, all the forums out. Um, so they were, you know, they were systematically infiltrating and, and, and getting guys arrested and taking down the forums and all this shit. And they're like, all these indictments are coming out. And they did this sweep where they arrested like fucking 200 people from fucking you know, all over the country and all over the world. Uh, it was in the news. It was in all the forums. Everybody was talking about it. So I'm super paranoid at this point. I'm like, fuck, man, maybe I could be one of those John Doe's. Like maybe, maybe I'm on this indictment list. They just don't know where, where I'm at. And so we're driving one day and I get pulled over. Um, I think one of the, honestly, this is so fucking cliche. I think we literally had an expired tag on my Cadillac. Um, for whatever reason, you know, lazy or whatever, my, or, or, you know, my girlfriend I was with at the time's a bubblehead and just didn't change it. We get pulled over. Um, I gave him my driver's license and my real name. You know, I'm still, you know, at this time I, 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 I know that I have obviously something to answer to eventually, but it's, it's so much time has passed and like, there's no indictment. There's no court date. I haven't been contacted. So, you know, I'm living with that in the back of my mind, but at the same time, it's like, I don't have to live under a, uh, assumed identity because I'm not really, you know, I'm still selling credit cards, but I'm not, you know, I didn't see the need for it. That's my number one mistake. Uh, I should have been, had another kind of Ryan Pearson deal set up. Uh, and I would, I walked away that day, but I, but I didn't. Uh, I gave him my real driver's license and they, and, and this is funny, we're sitting in the cop car, we're sitting in my car and there's one cop car and he, he, I took him a driver's license to the back and I told my wife, I says, when the second cop car pulls up, that's when you know you're fucked. Like I was just playing with her, you know what I mean? 10 minutes goes by, 15 minutes goes by. I'm starting to get nervous. My wife's visibly starting to get nervous. Second cop car pulled up, third cop car pulled up fourth cop car pulled up i'm like oh fuck when they form four cop cars pulled up and the motherfucker hasn't even come back with my driver's license in his hand in my window i know i'm fucking cooked cooked and at this time i'm like dude i just want to jump out and run like there was this there was a split second where i had my hand on the door handle and like i was just gonna fucking bolt i was gonna do it but something inside of me said no he got out when he was walking back to the car he didn't have my driver's license in his hand and i knew right away that he was going to ask me to step out of the vehicle which he did put me and he's like you have a warrant out for your arrest he's like you have a fail you, you have a federal warrant out for your arrest uh, out of the southern uh, or, or you know he didn't say the southern district of south carolina, south carolina he says you have a federal warrant out for your arrest uh so he's like so i have to take you into custody man and he was being real cool he's like dude i'm real sorry he's like i didn't want to arrest anybody today he was like an older guy he's like an older cop uh temple terrace in temple terrace here in uh, tampa florida 
and he says, uh, man, he's like, man, I'm fucking real sorry. He's like, man, I really didn't want to arrest anybody today. I was like, yeah, it is what it is, man. I got a warrant. Let's go. And I told my wife, I was like, listen, go home and get everything out of the house. I was like, get all the equipment out. I was like, get all, get rid of everything, everything. I was like, get rid of it. Cause in my mind, I, I'm now I'm going to jail for operation open market. Like it, it didn't even have occurred to me that this was from the shit from South Carolina, like a year and a half previous. Like I had fucking absolutely no, I had absolutely no clue. You know, I wasn't thinking about that. So when I got into jail and I finally got arraigned and I finally got in front of the judge, which I got arrested on a Friday. So I didn't get in front of the judge literally till like Monday or Tuesday. And Monday was my arraignment. And then Tuesday or Monday, and then I finally got to talk to a public defender, which told me that my warrant was out of the Southern District of South, of South Carolina. And that's when it dawned on me. I was like, oh, fuck, it's not for the Operation Open Market. It's for the shit that I had done. I was like, okay, this is finally, you know, I am finally have to fucking pay for this, which I was fine with that. They, I went in the, so like two or three days later, they transferred me from the uh, Hillsborough County Jail to the Pinellas County Jail to go in front of a federal judge because that's where they hold all the federal, uh, that's where they deal with all the federal shit is in Pinellas County. So I finally get in front of a federal judge. Um, I explain to them like, like listen, the this happened a year and a half, two years ago. I haven't been running from anything. I was like, I live in the same place. I, I have a job, um, you know, and you know, I, you know, you know, I, you can, so I, they gave me pretty much a PR bond, which is a personal bond. Like I have to pay any money. They let me go on pretrial services where I had to come pee in a cup and, you know, until I went back to court and all that shit. And I get home and, you know, my, my, my wife that I was with at this time, um, Rosalia got rid of everything. Uh, just as I, just as I had instructed, she got rid of all, all of the printers, all of the embossers, all of the equipment. She threw it in some bags and had the kids go fucking throw it in the trash can or whatever. So it was gone. I go into my drawer because I had all of my money. I never, I never kept a lot of cash on hand because you know people could fucking kick your door in and tie you up and rob you, and then all your cash is gone. So I kept all of my cash in like uh, I had investment accounts that I had debit cards to. I had um, like fucking Bitcoin accounts that I had debit cards to and shit like that. My wife went in my drawer and took the debit cards and put them with all the shit and got rid of everything. This was probably $1.2 million, $1.5 million uh, in all of the accounts that I had um, on the debit cards. Um, all of the hard drives that I had all of the information saved on, she threw away, she got rid of. Um, so I didn't have all my passwords to the accounts were gone. The, the social security numbers and, and date of birth that I used to open the accounts were gone. Um, you know, I didn't memorize any of this shit, so it was just gone. Like I didn't have, I, I should have had redundancies. Um, I always have redundancies. I set up like, you know, additional hard drives, you know, copy the information and go, I didn't, um, I fucked up. We all fucked up. We lost all the money. Uh, you know, and now I'm pretrial services. I'm, I'm going to jail. I'm fucking, you know, I, now I gotta go and, and deal with this shit. Uh, I had just enough money to pay the lawyer, uh, or no, actually I didn't have enough money to pay the lawyer. I had just enough money to pay, um, our rent at where we were living for pretty much the rest of the year. Um, and then now figure out how to navigate all of this legal shit that I was in. You know, I didn't have any money. Uh, I was back to pretty much uh, carding because I had, you know, I had a little bit of cards here and there that I could go out and I and use for like groceries and shit like that. But you know, um, I was smoking a lot of weed. I, I went on the run on, on on pretrial services. Like I got fucking I pissed dirty on like one of my UAs. Uh, so I took off and we moved from one side of Tampa to the other. Um, you know, and then the the marshals fucking figured out where I was. The U.S. marshals came and kicked my door in, took me to fucking jail. I had to get fucking extradited all the way up from, you know, Pinellas County, Florida to South Carolina, where I got back in front of the judge. Um, you know, and then uh, coincidentally, I'm going through all of these fucking trials and I'm going to court. And initially they wanted to, um, I'm not going to talk about like the, 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 sentencing and the jail experience and going to jail and all that shit like that. Cause I don't really, I had, I had, I had a run of the mill uh, experience when I went to prison. Um, I didn't get raped. I didn't get fucking robbed. I didn't get extorted. I didn't get beat up. Um, I seen some crazy shit. Like I seen people get their heads split open. I seen a couple people get fucking stabbed up pretty good. Um, but nothing too, nothing too bad. Um, it was usually over gambling debts and you know, shit like that. Um, you know, so I had like a run-of-the-mill prison experience. I went to a medium, I went to, or I'm sorry, I went to a low security 
Um, you know, it was, it was the, my experience in county jail was rougher than when I actually got to prison. Um, so the initial, the initial, uh, offer they came was, was like 150 months or something like that. Um, which is like 15 years. And my lawyer, um, at the, my court appointed lawyer, my federal court appointed lawyer at this time, God bless her heart, uh, Karen Everett, she saved my life. Um, she figured out that the old man opening my package, uh, he was not supposed to. Um, the postmaster general is the only one with the uh, actual authority to open uh, sealed mail. And he didn't do that. The old man at the, at the, at the, at the UPS store opened it. Um, so they had to get rid of the... Oh, what charges were they? They had to get rid of the possession of a fraudulent transaction device. They had to get rid of the possession of a counterfeit um, equi equipment. They had to get rid of the mail fraud. They had to get rid. They had to drop so many fucking charges. It was ridiculous. Um, the only thing that they could really pin on me was the aggravated identity theft. Because I did have my picture on somebody else's driver's license. Um, which carried a mandatory minimum sentence of 24 months. And that's and and essentially that's what I ended up with. I ended up with a 24 month sentence in federal prison, um, which I did at Coleman, Florida, at a at a low security prison. I I did six months a halfway house, uh, so I didn't even really sit in prison for the whole 24 months. Um, you know, and then I got out. I actually got out of fucking halfway house and. Started making credit cards again, believe it or not. Uh, fucking, I don't even really want to get into that whole story because that was just, that's just been an absolute fucking nightmare for me. If you guys know anything about me or my story that you can hear that story on the Concrete Podcast. Um, but I got back out and I ended up violating and going back and I did like nine months and they ended up actually, I had three, three years of federal probation. Uh, I went back and did nine months of violation. They killed my paper, which means they terminated my probation uh, and kind of just released me uh, out the door. And that was in 2016. Uh, here we are in 2022 and I haven't been uh, in any kind of trouble since. Uh, I haven't even had a, a parking ticket uh, so much as a parking ticket um, since then. Um, you know, I have embarked on this whole uh, YouTube journey now where I, I have a, a, you know, what I deem to be a moderately successful uh, YouTube channel. Um, you know, it's growing every day. My social media presence is growing every day. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm helping people, um, you know, deal with, you know, life situations or, you know, helping people make better decisions. I, um, I get to wake up every single day and pretty much run my own program and do whatever I want to do. Uh, I'm a successful tattoo artist. Um, you know, I tattoo every single day and, uh, my, you know, my main focus is, like I said, it's just, you know, creating content and doing YouTube and doing long format, um, you know, interviews with interesting people. Uh, and you know, I feel like I just, I have such a wealth of life experience to draw from that. I, I, I know my, my value, uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, you know, and this whole thing has just been such a fucking wild ride, uh, you know, from beginning to end. I, I met in federal prison. I met Matthew Cox, uh, who helped me write my memoir, uh, Bent. Uh, you can, it's available on Amazon. You can, you can get it on Amazon. It's 329 fucking pages, uh, 35 chapters. Um, you know, it, it tells all of the little interesting, you know, side stories that I didn't really get into, uh, you know, in this, it, it just gets, it's a good book. It's a good read. Um, I knew I'd recommend it to anybody who's interested, uh, in my life or my story. Um, and yeah, that's me. That's, that's John Boziak. I, um, you know, I've just always been, trying to survive and my whole life has just been one struggle to the next and you know I'm not a bad guy you know I'm not I've never been you know like a, a raper or a fucking stabber or you know one of those people who takes advantage of, of people that I know were like down and out you know I never I was you know I kept my scumbaggery to a certain level you know I was never um I would never took it too far. I don't feel I, you know, even with all of the fraud and all of the credit card shit, I, I don't ever really feel like I hurt. Um, I, you know, I, my, the pain I caused people was, was that bad. Um, you know, I may have caused a few people some, um, minor fucking irritation, 
financial irritation. But at the end of the day, everybody gets their money back. You know, it's only it was the banks that were re really getting fucked over. Um, and fuck those motherfuckers anyway. So, yeah, that's me. That's John Boziak. Um, yeah.